getting lost in the neighborhood there. So I will call the meeting um, of the adjourned regular meeting of the study session of the Planning Commission for the City of San Clemente, California, um, Wednesday, September 4th to order. And tonight we're very fortunate. We have um, Mr. Uh, Henry Lenny here to give us a presentation on Spanish colonial architecture. So let me turn it right over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't remember the last time I w we were here, but it's changed a lot for the better. <laughs> I just took a quick tour of the shopping center and I was cruising around and I thought, oh, this is going in the right direction. But, um, you know, uh, rather than making a lecture and a presentation, I really would love to see all of us get into a discussion. If you see something interesting or if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions, uh, completely open to that. And, uh, but the purpose of this is really to show you where this whole Spanish architecture came from and why. And, and it's a very complex, turbulent process that led us here because Spain didn't have any architecture of any kind. Uh, and they were conquered by everyone and their grandmother, really, you know, over the years, the Celtics, the Romans, the 
Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals. But finally, finally, the Muslims uh, begin to expand. And uh, from Persia, and the capital of Persia was Iran. And they were a highly sophisticated uh, civilization by even before they came into, uh, let me see, do I just press the button? It's the right oh, okay. So anyway, this is, this is where it all began and it's continuing. Uh, Spanish architecture as we call it, or Hispanic architecture, is still one of the most long lasting movements, I think, in architecture uh, throughout the world, including Chicago, believe it or not. There's some amazing Spanish houses in Chicago, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to me in a community outside of Chicago. But nonetheless, uh, it, it has stood the test of time. So this is what Spain was like uh, when the Celtics uh, conquered the Spain, they brought in their technology and their technology consisted of hot roofs and they would raise the buildings for because they also stored their food inside those buildings and they were very rudimentary buildings. And then the Romans came and the Romans were much more sophisticated. They knew how to build bridges and as you probably all know they invented the arch, and, uh, and they left a good imprint, but they were not there long. Um, and this is a Roman uh, chapel uh, that was there. But you can see how rustic things were. One of the things about architecture anywhere in the world is that in, in the old times, they didn't have the benefit of steel or importing materials or plastics and so on and so forth. They had to do what they could find. And this is why uh, Mexico is a good example. There are some communities in Mexico where all they use is adobe blocks because they have adobe and clay. In some other areas, they use uh, stone because that's all there is. Well, when the when the Arabs came, the Muslims or the Moors, and, and again the whole the whole web of cultures is, is intricate. But uh, the Arabs basically conquered North Africa, and then from North Africa, the Moors with the Islamics they came to Spain and they conquered it. There was one thing about the uh, Arabic civilization; they were highly advanced. Uh, they were Muslims, and so they had some restrictions. But uh, they were amazing engineers. They knew about medicine. They knew about mathematics, and I'll explain why they invented algebra, and it's really for the most unexpected reason. And here's the reason why. In order to come up with these intricate patterns, they actually had to come up and invent algebra. That was the only way. They couldn't do it. And one of the reasons their articulation was, as you see that here, is because the Muslim religion forbids any depiction of anything that is alive, birds, humans, and so on. But rather than doing that, they came up with geometric patterns and occasionally, well, it's the screen. If you, if you look at the, the left-hand side on top of the column, uh, that is an Arabic poem that they used to incorporate. Now, one of the things to take notice here is the way the columns support the enormous mass of the building. Uh, the the, they felt that the columns had to be very slender. And they understood the concept of compression. Things are very strong when you take a stick, much stronger than when you bend the stick. And they understood that. 
And somehow they managed to keep the entire building together, even though they had, you know, weather as well and so on. But they understood all that. It was it was not um, it, it was not at random. And this is another building in which you would find similarities to what we have today is the idea of the focal points, uh, the idea of the axes. And also, if you notice in the center of this slide, there is a very, very small fountain. They, the lack of water essentially kept them from doing all these wonderful fountains that they did before. And they also predominantly used uh, the citrus trees. And there was a practical reason for that as well. The Alhambra, of course, is one of the most magnificent buildings in the world. But you have to wonder, uh, how did they know to do this then? Well, they knew. They understood engineering. And if you notice the way the windows are framed and articulated, but the focal point, again, is this axis and the water and the reflection. All that was deliberately done and planned. Some of the palaces that they came up with uh, uh, was just simply amazing. Now, if you look at those columns, and if you look at the tiles, they're not really tiles. They're tiny little pieces of clay that were glazed and put together. Imagine the amount of work that, that uh, it took to do that. In fact, uh, we were designing a house in, in, in Santa Barbara, and it was a Moroccan house. And I thought, I wonder if someone can duplicate that. And we did. We duplicated, but not the way they used to. They actually, they were done in Mexico, and they were glazed. And they actually drew every geometric form for these columns. And of course, they were done in two pieces. Realizing the amount of time that it took, I realized that they didn't have the technology or the knowledge or the wisdom or the intelligence to do what they did here. But everything had an, 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 an expression. And they were trying to produce an expression of order, primarily. Yes. It was, you know, it was trial and error. It was like during the Gothic period in England. Uh, most of their buildings used to fall before they were finished. And once they understood why the arches failed, they made some modifications. And eventually they invented the um, what do you call them, the flying trusses or buttresses, uh, yeah. Because they realized that in a building that was that tall, having the trust, they needed something to take the load and spread it throughout. And Notre Dame is a perfect example of that, you see. And they also wanted a lot of stained glass windows, so they were losing the mass that was supporting the roof, you see. In this case, I suspect that they just didn't wake up and go to college and studied engineering. I have a feeling that they had to see some failures on these. But by the time they got to Spain, they were, they were very well versed in engineering. This particular building started off as a mosque, and 100 years later, it became a cathedral, then a mosque again, and then a cathedral again. But the wonderful thing about the Christians they admire what the Muslims did, and they didn't destroy it. Also, keeping the same uh, vernacular, uh, you see this building, which is a brute, but you can see the detailing throughout. Somehow, they had to create an expression. It, it wasn't good enough to leave it plain. 
they, they wanted to celebrate the ability of human beings to create something wonderful, even as rudimentary as this building is. And this is a fine, fine piece of uh, artisans. If you look at the door in the arch first, you know, they, they were just obsessed by creating an expression. Uh, the tiles, the doors, which were recessed back, and the way the doors worked, they were obviously not hinges, they used a, um, a ring and a spike that held the doors in place. But when you had the doors closed, even you, you lost some of the detailing. Uh, it would still give you a hint of it. When you open the doors to the inside, then the whole artistic expression of the doors was revealed. And who would ever come up with this? This is amazing. I mean, to actually carefully build this eight-pointed stars in the ceiling just for the sake of creating some light. And light and shadow, and shadow later became a very important element of uh, Spanish architecture. And you can see here how things became more and more refined as, as the years went. And remember, these were all carved by hand. Now, there was an, uh, an interesting technique that the Arabs use in, uh, throughout uh, Iran and in that area. The sun was so ruthless that they invented these screens called arabesque. And you'll see some more photographs later on where they also invented a room called the Mirador, which was cantilevered out of the building and it had all these arabesque to be able to get some ventilation, but at the same time, light, but without a blinding, burning light that was inherent in that part of the world. I, I found this picture, and it goes to show the influence, I think, of just a small form like this arch and, and let me just talk a little bit about this, this arch. The Romans invented the proper arch. What they didn't take under consideration is that the stress of the building put the forces on the side of the arch, and it destroyed the arch, and it collapsed. They always thought, well, if we have a keystone on top, the arch can actually hold great weights. But if the weight was too great, it would come up almost before you got to the capital. Well, the Moorish understood that. So they widened the sides of it to increase the strength uh, geometrically. And then you have something that is a little bit more uh, contemporary, I think, in, in Casa Romantica as well. But it was still, it was still an image, uh, you know, Ollie Hansen, uh, I'm sure he had numerous books on some of the primitive Spanish architecture. And it was something that fit in very well, I think, in the architecture of the 1920s. Well, uh, how, uh, what happened then after the, in, in 1920s? What, what brought in the revival of Spanish colonial? There were a number of factors. In Southern California primarily, and not in too many places, it was Santa Barbara, it was San Diego, and it was San Clemente, uh, which really took the lead in the Spanish colonial revival movement. Uh, and it all came with a thing called Romanticism. And this is a painting, if you've ever seen it in real life, extremely disturbing, it's terrifying. It is, um, 
it is you almost place yourself there and you feel the anguish and the stress of trying to survive and this painting was done by Gerard Colt who was a romantic and he created this whole term of romanticism romanticism when this painting was done was not about falling in love or being in a wonderful place it was a uh, an attempt to create an expression. In this case, it shocked you. It created an expression. And you walked away, and you probably never forgot it. And that was the expression. Later in the years, in, in the 1920s in California, the same thing happened, but this time in the opposite way. It, there were movies like the Alhambra, El Zorro, uh, there were a number of exhibitions that occur, the first one in Chicago, the other one in San Francisco, and the last one in San Diego, uh, the Panama exhibition in, in San Diego, whose architect was uh, Beltran Goodhue, uh, to me one of the most prolific architects in, of, in the United States. He had a small house in Santa Barbara, a studio and so on, which is still there. But he did Balboa Park. And Balboa Park is an amazing uh, development. And here we were talking about sketching and so on. He would always sketch things and create his vision. He got his inspiration by traveling to Mexico and seeing the towers, the churrasgoresque and Baroque towers in Mexico, in other places, in Spain as well. And he applied all that, all that uh, vision uh, into, into the architecture. And you can see here, it's just probably this picture depicts kind of the history of Spanish architecture, everything from the Renaissance period to Baroque. But if you're ever in in San Diego, and if you ever get a chance to come here, look closely at the details. For instance, some of the um, projecting beams out of the buildings, they are crazy. They, they're uh, crazy in the sense that they're figures of women and monsters and things like that. At a glance, when you see them, you say, well, they're corvals. Uh, well, there's more than corvals to that. And he just had a wonderful time with uh, creating these. And you can see here uh, the influence of the architecture at the time of Mexico, who had then advanced into the more Baroque, churrasgoresque type of architecture. But he had an interesting way of taking the intricate and neutralizing it with the simple. Uh, it, it, if the whole building would have been this, it would have been crazy. But if you notice, he wanted to place emphasis in the focal points. Also, the tower. The tower is there, and it's beautiful, and you can experience it. But you can also see the tower from a long place away. So it depicted a sense of place from a distance. And then where this come from, I have no idea. It, uh, it, it, it's reminiscent of some of the arbolariums that were done in England, although they were done much differently. And, and you see the two entrances in the arches, which is also reminiscent of the Mission Revival period in California. And, uh, to me, this is an incredible building. It's, it's just amazing. And then the was, uh, let me see, the Panama exhibition in San Francisco. And here again, they, uh, I don't know who the architect for this was, but there were many architects, I guess. But it was an attempt to create a village, a town, a city, in Spain, and that created a whole movement of romanticism, like I said before. 
and, and here it is. You know, sadly, these buildings were not meant to last. Uh, they were built out of paper mache for the most part and put a slight coat of uh, plaster and they lasted for several weeks and then they were all torn down and gone. The only one building that survived in San Francisco, you see that rotunda uh, there in which um, someone decided to leave it and then recently, 10, 15 years ago, they decided to restore it and it's still there, but that's the only thing that is left of it. All right, in San Clemente, uh, Ollie Hansen had a vision, and his vision was uh, a village by the sea. And he proposed it to his investors, his partners, and they all said, you're crazy. What, what do you want to build anything in San Clemente? I mean, you have San Diego. And he says, no, it's perfect. San Clemente is perfect, and it needs to be a village. It, it has to be a village. And he had this um, illusion, he had this vision, again, based on the influence of everything that I just said, of having a little village with horses, and, who know, El Soro showing up or something like that. But he felt that from a financial point of view, that that would have enormous potential. And of course, he was right. Uh, San Clemente, again, has grown enormously, and it was enormously successful, and it really confirmed the vision that Oli Hansen had. Uh, and uh, th th this is the, well, let me go back. His office was fair, uh, built first and then the building across the street, and then finally the Hotel San Clemente. And, and because even at that point, San Clemente was becoming a little bit popular. And so he thought, well, we need to have a hotel. But look at the architecture. It's, it's a tall building. And what mitigates the height of the building? The plaza. The plaza breaks this potentially very large building into something that was um, manageable in terms of the pieces. It contains bits of classical architecture by the configuration, but uh, introducing the loggia in the middle and so on to, again, try to reduce the mass. I'm only guessing what he was doing, but I think there's evidence of many other architects who try the same technique successfully. And then finally, the, the third floor of the building was set back, and then the tower, essentially. To this day, it's still a wonderful place to have coffee. And, uh, and you walk by it and, and you know, it doesn't have the impact that one would think would have in a large building. And I assume this was the train station at one point, uh, and I'm not sure if it's still there or not. Uh, not a bad idea to rebuild it again. <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, just uh, look at the way that big window, the window's large, and so to mitigate that, uh, the architect actually uh, chamfered or he brought in the sides of the building. And also notice that enormous fountain supporting that part of the roof. Uh, that's what makes it a romantic expression of architecture. But the one consistent thing that you will see over and over again Look at the depth of the openings. And the depth of the openings, well, was to create an illusion of the type of architecture that might have been done out of adobe or stone, which generally the walls were pretty, pretty thick. But what it does is the, this wonderful play of shadows, light and shadows, contrast and variation. Um, the building has a beginning 
And then the roof tile, which is a completely different material, terminates the building beautifully. And I don't know what this is. <laughs> but uh, I found this picture, and I don't know if this building exists. Uh, could it be the... It burned down in 1975. It burned down. Uh, is that where the golf course is? No, no. Oh, oh, oh. Really? But you can begin to see by that time, during the time that this photograph was taken, uh, you can see the Miramar Theater in the end. And you can also begin to see the articulation of the buildings going up and down and up and down. Um, interestingly enough, the wall, uh, the back wall of the um, Miramar Theater, uh, uh, is a really great expression. Uh, blank walls are not bad. Blank walls are sometimes very good. And I'll show you more examples of some. And this is kind of the character of San Clemente as it was. You know, the first time I came to San Clemente was in 1949, two years after I was born. This was my parents' favorite vacation spot. We would land in Tijuana, take the train to San Clemente, spend a week or two here, and then went on to Santa Barbara and then back to San Clemente again. So I've seen a bit of a transformation of since then. Uh, at some point it went really bad, and now it's going really good. So, typical of any city. It's slowly recovering, that's the word. Now, to me, if you really take notice of this building, which is the Beach Club, it's one of the most creative buildings I've ever seen. It's nautical. The detailing is so unusual. Um, let me see if I can get closer. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. And, and this is Soli Hansen's uh, office. And again, very simple architecture. The walls relative to the windows are critically important Spanish architecture. If you're going to have a window, there must be enough mass on each side of the window. Otherwise, it becomes contemporary. And you can see how he, interestingly enough, the main entrance of, to his office, actually the opening is slightly tilted. And, and I'm sure there was a deliberate uh, expression of it. And this is San Clemente. Uh, you know, the, at, at the time, I was surprised to see some of these buildings. I thought they were more modern than they are, but they're not. And this is what you saw. And if you look at the beautiful hillside behind it, and City Hall, of course, which had, takes on a Moorish architecture motif as well. Anyway, back to this building. Uh, if you walk around the building and if you look at every single thing, the parapets are slanted back from the piers. Why? So that there can be a little shadow there, so that you can break up that parapet on top. The stairway, the way it kind of wraps around, it's just so grateful. And the repetitive windows on the side, um, what you can see here, uh, the repetitive windows that occur way at the end of the building with the little eyebrow on top. If you notice, all the headers are done out of um, stucco. And also the surface and the texture of the stucco. The tower is unbelievable. Uh, it's very large, almost out of proportion with the rest of the building, but it has such strength that it does work. And then, of course, it's articulated with tile. And Jim Pest just used to tell me that there was a wonderful weather vane, which I think had some pictures, and he was going to try to replicate that and put it back again. 
Hmm? You did? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> really? That is fantastic. Well, this is the the handrail that you saw there. I am not sure that that wall at the end was there. Maybe it was. And uh, the rail wall. But here you see how everything just is rough but graceful. The, the setting back of the wall of the parapets. And then, of course, the, um, the tile on top. Yeah, this is one of my favorite elevations here. Everything, the way the pergola was treated on the second floor. And there's those repetitive windows. To me, it reminds me of some ship. And, uh, and again, I don't think that was a coincidence. I think he, he had an absolute vision on this. And then I don't know if I have a photographs of the tower. The way the tower comes to the ground, it has this buttresses, which is very characteristic of the secessionist architecture in Vienna done by Otto Wagner. He used techniques like that. It was half traditional and half modern, but more traditional than modern. So this building is very unique. I don't think you can find a building like this anywhere in the world. Uh, even the, um, the bowling alley here, um, which I believe was built after the theater, wasn't it? And, but the simple eyebrow to the entrance and the tile that you see on top, I'm sorry, this is a terrible photograph, but the tile that you see on top, there are actually two parapets. And the cap tile is placed on each one of the two. And uh, uh, to me, again, this is just the most elegant expression of simple architecture, just the opening. And also, if you notice, the frame of the opening is actually curved. All right, here's uh, the San Clemente Hotel again. I ran into a postcard of the lobby, and it was pretty elegant. I just I scanned it, but it was this big, and tried to enlarge it and do it. Um, Casa Romantica, it is... Uh, it's really interesting how the ceilings, the roofs, the pitch of the roof was kept unusually low, but it works all together. It, it's almost contemporary, of course it's not, but it's almost contemporary, and of course the focal point is that uh, horseshoe arch with the intricate doors behind it. And then there were all these Holy Hansen houses, which uh, again, I, we took a ride around town and, and they're simple. They're simple, but again, the thick uh, openings everywhere. An interesting treatment of the way the tile roof terminates with the, with the corbels. Of course, they won't let us do that today because we have to put a gutter in a downspout. Well, you can still get the same expression. And one of my favorite buildings is the Beachcomber Hotel. It's, it's just the, the epitome of sensitivity to the topography. And this is where we used to stay, and still stay from time to time when we come here. Um, it, the way it scales down, it's, um, even for that time, it was very, very interesting, taking advantage of the views, but also from the street side. It's almost stark, but beautiful, very beautiful. And with the right camera, you can really take some great artistic photographs of this. And it's still here, and I'm so glad, and I hope it never goes away.
It's got a lot of history. And then on the other side of the building, those where the picture windows are. Justifiably so. So there is a certain respect to the community by keeping the vernacular or the architecture style simple and in the San Clemente style. And then of course on, on the view side, then they took a little bit more freedom. But by that time, it wasn't that you were looking back at the architecture, you were looking from inside the architecture to the ocean, which, which again, everybody thought then and think now that that's a glorious thing to do, especially on sunset. And again, quickly, this is just the influence of that Moorish style of architecture, which was again done in a very interesting way and very different way, but that was the influence. And this is the interior of it, which is completely unexpected. In some of the newer buildings, I think those same principles of terminating the building with an intricate, um, uh, soffit, not for the sake of being intric intricate, for the sake of creating shadows. And this little building, I don't know where it is. It could be um, Casa Pacifica or portions of it. But again, it just look at the way the things, the masses step up, and step down. In fact, I was so inspired by this little building that we designed a restaurant in Santa Barbara. And I thought, you know, we have to try something like this because it really does work well. And I think this is Casa Pacifica, the back of it. Well, it's Spanish, uh, the Spanish colonial revival. Uh, in Santa Barbara, during the devastating earthquake of 1925, most of the buildings were destroyed, but most of the buildings were not Spanish. Uh, they were actually Midwest neoclassical style architecture that was built with the blonde bricks and unreinforced. And at some point in time, they thought, this is great. Let's do a neoclassical Midwest American architecture. Well, all those buildings fell down. And whatever was left was severely damaged. And, uh, but there was a period that was there before uh, that was very, pronounced, and that was the, the Mexican period, as it was called. That was when the Mexicans still uh, had hold of California. And this is Casa Romanti, uh, sorry, uh, not, it's not the Presidio. Um, well, anyway, it, it was a private residence. And uh, uh, there were remnants of the building that were there that were changed over and over again. And finally, with a lot of research, um, we discovered that there were actually two tiers of tiles. And you see the, um, the large columns and so on. And there was actually a step down. Well, they had all kinds of parties here, and it was one of the most pronounced families. Um, it was, uh, was it De La Guerra? Yeah, De La Guerra owned this building. And you can just imagine all the wonderful gatherings that they had during the summer and so on. And um, anyway, uh, the American Institute of Architects decided to have a, a, a coloring book depicting some of the landmarks of Santa Barbara. And uh, I was asked to try to portray in the watercolor what was things like during this time. And so I came up with this. There were probably models, and there was a bull chasing a guy, a dog smiling at the other end. It probably wasn't that wild, you know? It was a little bit milder than that, but there you have it. That was my expression. 
But you can see actually the mass of the building. It's, it's all done out of, out of adobe. The walls are about four feet deep. And uh, we went through the restoration of this building and we basically disassembled it and put it together again in order to meet code. We, we, we actually took the walls out. We put a reinforced concrete uh, wall with a lintel on top and then put all of the adobe back again together. The detailing, again, uh, they were, they built things with what they had. And the ceiling was done with a thing called tule, which is a form of bamboo, essentially. And they wrapped the whole thing together with cowhide. And they lasted for many, many years. But it's just fascinating to see the different techniques that they had. And the same with the Presidio. This is the Presidio. Uh, most of it was gone. And what you see in front of you, including the um, wing at the very end, um, was a reconstruction of it. But it was done in very much in the same construction method as it was before. The roof tiles, which are almost double the size of a regular tile. They're about this big. They were actually produced right here on the site because there was a lot of clay in the backyard of this building. And here's another example of what they were. Generally, they would not leave the adobe exposed. They would put a whitewash to protect the adobe because otherwise it would melt. One of the discussions that we had was the tower. And, and that was a real dilemma. Everyone thought that tower was ugly and that we shouldn't put it back. We shouldn't put a tower at all. And the director of the Presidio says, hey, you can't change history and can't embellish history. We gotta put things as they are. And so we did after, everybody was disappointed because before the tower, that whole element was very, very beautiful. And also part of that period was the mission. Um, that was partially destroyed during the earthquake as well. Uh, one of the interesting stories that I should tell you, uh, when Padre Junipero Serra came and he was in charge of building the missions in California, um, he had a vision of what the missions should look like, and he thought the entrance should be six ionic columns. And he was given the drawings to the Shumash Indians. They had no idea what an ionic column was. And so they looked at the picture, and they came up with their own <laughs> ram's head, which is actually wonderful. And inside, uh, this is a courtyard, which now you can take some tours and take a look at things. The building has an enormous strength. And you also notice how they would break the tile roof. They would change the pitch, which is really a wonderful, wonderful look. And um, later on, uh, between the adobe period, there came the mission style architecture, which didn't last very long, but a lot of the train stations were, um, took on the same mission style of architecture. And what are the identifying characteristics of the mission style? Well, the, the, the strong announcement of where the entrance was very, very large overhangs. And the stucco texture was almost as if it was sprayed with a machine. It was very rough. And the buildings were never white. They were predominantly some earth tone color. 
Well, this is a photograph um, that shows a lot of things, and there are some very similar things that happen here in, in San Clemente. This picture was taken in one of the hills uh, on Carrillo Street, uh, which actually looks at the whole building. But one of the reasons, that, one of the things that I wanted you to notice is uh, the Arlington Theater. The height of it is enormous. It's very tall. And it was designed that way so that it became kind of the, the chapel in the village where the church was the predominant architecture and everything kind of scaled down. But, and I'll show you some photographs, when we get down to the pedestrian level, it completely changes. The other building uh, uh, that is up in the hill is the Monocito Country Club, which was also designed by Beltran Goodhue, um, and the, you know, the architect that designed Balboa Park. And uh, we just finished restoring the building. We put a little addition where the, the one story is, and I was really, we were really terrified of doing that because we thought, gosh, how can you how can you put an addition to the sacred building? And we, we struggled and struggled and found a way of make, making it completely subservient to uh, the rest. And then the Arlington Theater, which was designed by George Washington Smith and Luther Riggs. Uh, this is something I've never seen in my life. Remember we talked about walls and things? Um, it's just the way that the forms were manipula manipulated. Uh, the idea of the curved wall and the enormous uh, backstage uh, building, uh, sorry, f uh, mass. And this is what it is today. Now, one thing I want you to notice in this picture Look at the moldings. The moldings are about eight feet high, but they're still the traditional moldings. Why so big, one would say? Well, because the wall is tall, and you need it to proportionally keep those moldings large. And just some more details. Yeah, and, and again, a detail like this just simply shows that the purpose of the intricate configuration is to give you a series of shadows with different values. Otherwise, that whole mass would not have been as successful as it, as it is. And yeah, here's a, a photograph where the molding was just sliced at the same level is the entry of the door. I mean, even, even within the Spanish architecture, to me in the 1920s, this was a very, very creative way of dealing with an architectural mass. And the Arlington Theater. Um, the Arlington Theater was designed by Plunkett. And he was a great artist. And it was owned by the Fox people at the time that owned most of the theaters, I think, in California. But their style of architecture was more of the neoclassical style, like you would see in the Million Dollar Theater in Los Angeles and so on. And so <clears throat> Blunkett was asked to come and submit a presentation to the Fox people. And he just showed up. He had a few drinks in the evening. He got up early in the morning. He pulled a liner out of the drawer and sketched that. Well, they loved it. Mm -hmm. And all the other architects, uh, prominent architects were saying, what, you're just bringing this piece of paper and you're showing us to do this? But it was just something completely different. Also, the wonderful thing about this building is 
in, in a certain sense, it mimics, yeah, you can, um, before I get there, you can see actually the, um, the carving of the forms of the building. You know, if you don't know anything about architecture, but if you're walking along this paseo and you look at that, you say, gosh, there's something here special, but I don't know what's special about this, but there is something special. It's just the whole strength, the mass of the building. Uh, he did something very clever. It, this is where the premieres in the 1920s of all the movies were happening, as it is with the film festival. Uh, but Plunkett thought, you know, uh, we should do something like they did at the Paris Opera House, where they had, if you remember seeing pictures of this wonderful stairway. And the purpose of the stairway was to have the ladies and the gentlemen show off their, um, their outfits uh, before they went inside the theater. Well, this was the same principle. There's a large loggia that occurs so that people can get a chance to chat a little bit. Again, we're talking about the 1920s uh, and, and can, can talk before going inside the theater. This is another thing that you should all take notice a little bit. If you look at the parapet of this building, it's only about 10 inches to 12 inches projecting out of the building. At certain times of the day, it produces a shadow that is larger than six feet. That breaks the mass of the building already. And if you stagger the tiles, you get this very, very intricate tile pattern. And look at the balcony. This is an enormous blank wall, and there's so very few things on it, and this is what they are. And there was, again, not an accident. This was deliberately done. And very quickly, this is a building that has morphed throughout time. Uh, and it's got just about every component of the architecture that we all talked about. It's got the Monterey-style uh, balcony. It's got the Moorish-style arch, uh, uh, arches at the base. And it's got the intricate um, windows on top. It is, it is a very tall building, but it really does work well. And again, notice the shadows. And notice the way the building ends. Y you know, architecture is a little bit like a symphony of form. You have a beginning, you have a theme, and you have an ending. In this case, this is not a chimney. This is just a column that tells you that the building has ended. And I love the delicate aspect of this Monterey uh, balcony here. Uh, usually the Monterey balconies that we see today, they're just too chunky and too massive, and they should be a little bit more delicate. And then instead of using the pickets, he used the spindles. And this is a detail of that column. And look at also the depth of the windows. One of the most wonderful techniques is to slope like you saw at the Beach Club here in San Clemente, is to slope the sills down because it does create some, a wonderful uh, pattern of shadows. This is the St. Anthony Seminary, which is uh, almost like a Renaissance building. Um, and, and again, it's got a very tall tower that you can see f everywhere from Santa Barbara. It's got a very strong stone base, which is really, really unusual. And then if you just notice some of the articulation on the windows on the top floors, which were generally shorter than the windows on the second floor, which were shorter 
than the windows on the first floor. So there was a whole hierarchy of fenestration in this building. Uh, to me, this is one of the most brilliant little buildings. It's tiny. Uh, <coughs> And there's a lot of things that are happening that you would think would not work. The round window on top, the arch window, but then it actually tapers back into a column. Uh, the balcony that is resting on top of the uh, wooden header, and then the opening of the building. This is, this is sometimes where the magic happens in, in architecture. In other words, uh, the wonderful thing about Spanish architecture is that really it, the sky is the limit. You can do anything you want because it isn't like the architecture of the Renaissance period. This is El Paseo and next to it is Casa de la Guerra. Uh, this building is really two stories and three stories and this was built in the 1920s. And the scale of it is absolutely wonderful. You know, some people are a little bit scared of tall buildings. Well, if you manipulate them correctly, they can really be a wonderful asset. The use of dormers instead of skylights, uh, which are, for any building, whether it's a house or a commercial building, is a wonderful tool to bring light into uh, the building, particularly when you have a porch in front of it that does not allow the sun to come in. And this is El Paseo. El Paseo is the oldest sh shopping center in California, and it was done in the 1920s. And, uh, but also look at the depth of the windows mm -hmm. and, and just the whole uh, manipulation of the forms and the masses up and down and so on. And this is uh, a passel that leads into City Hall and the way the architecture is carried out. This is another arcade with a vaulted ceiling. And, and this is a really good picture that kind of defines and probably would apply to San Clemente as well. It is the variation of heights in the building. It's, 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 it's great to have variation in the architecture, but it's even better to be able to, whether you have a two-story building and you make it much taller than the two-story building next to it in a one-story and then back up again, it just creates the village look, the village effect. This is a building that we did many years ago and, and we had a lot of fun with it. We used every component that we could. It's a tiny little building, um, but uh, uh, it's got a lot of art. It, it was a little bit of an experiment that we did and, and, it, and you know, it, it, it turned out well. A tiny building. And this is uh, a series of houses that were done in the 1920s that are very, very similar to the Ole Hansen houses here in San Clemente. But just again, the whole breakup of the masses and the forms, even though the architecture itself is fairly simple. I don't know where this house is, but this is probably done in the 1930s where the Art Deco uh, style became prominent. You can see by the curving of the wall, it works. Now the other thing, besides the architecture, the other thing that really have to be taken into consideration is just the public places that kind of wraps everything together. In this case, uh, um, George Washington Smith uh, did a depiction of De La Guerra Plaza which never happened. And there were numerous studies that were done after that in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the 1940s. And uh, I volunteered to come up with this plan. And so I did it. And of course, it didn't go anywhere. And now there's a new study and a new design. In fact, there's a 
whole book on some of the studies that were done for De La Guerra Plaza. Uh, but it, it is it's, it's the way this was designed, it was a place where you can still have access to the cars for deliveries of the restaurants and, and so on, but at certain times you can close the entire plaza and, and have a farmer's market or have a festival or fiestas or, or something like that. But having this is having a this open space, a plaza is, is a little similar than having uh, Central Park in in uh, New York, where it brings up a relief of the architecture. And um, part, uh, let me see, this is um, Stork Placita leading to State Street, and. The King of Spain donated a statue of King Carlos, which the city probably didn't want, but they had to take because it was a gift from the king. And so they had me design a pedestal, and so I did this fountain, and then they put King Carlos on top of it. I mean, it's a well done sculpture, but he was not a good looking man. <laughs> if this is. And so, Anyway, um, it was done. And some group of people said, well, King Carlos was not a good guy. He, he, he was not kind to the Chumash Indians. You gotta move it. You gotta take it away. So they took King Carlos and put it behind the Presidio. Ironically, where they put it, where a cemetery where the Chumash were buried. <laughs> you know, it's just total drama. <laughs> And then they said, well, what do we need this fountain for? The derelicts are abusing it, so they removed it. Uh, again, the Spanish style had an influence, and I'll go quickly through these slides, uh, had an influence throughout the world, especially in, in, in the Americas, in Latin America throughout. But in Spain, this was the depiction of a Moorish architecture by Jujol, and he was like Gaudi, he was a crazy guy. And he says, okay, I'm gonna do a Moorish building, and there you have it. It works, it really does. Hey, yeah, exactly. Uh, and remember we were talking about the mirror doors? Well, Peru really adopted them, and they loved them, and in you can see the buildings behind it and around the corner. This mirror door is done out of teak and it's really a masterpiece. And the architecture is, uh, is, is Renaissance and so on. But you can see the man standing at the entrance to the church and you can see how massive these are. So the great thing about the architecture and the influence of the uh, Moors was that they kind of left an idea in which communities then took that idea and they made it happen in their own creative ways. And this is another building in Peru, just around the corner with a balcony, but it's also a, a mirror door as well. And this is a very old building with a wooden teak balcony in a base of stone. The base of stone was there before the building was built. And even in North Africa, you know, they were influenced by the whole uh, Islamic Moorish movement. This is a house that we just finished uh, in Santa Barbara, where also uh, the client loved the whole Moroccan architecture thing, and we, we used the same type of uh, imagery than the buildings that we saw previously. Now this this is a real surprise, this building is in Guadalajara. And I, one year, took the Landmarks Commission on a tour of Guadalajara because there was a lot of Hispanic buildings there. And David Gephardt, if, if, you, if you knew who he was, one of the most prolific architectural historians insisted in walking. He was an older man, but he would walk five miles without any problem. And instead of taking the main street, uh, 
He decided to just meander through the city. And in one of the neighborhoods, we found this building, and he stopped, and he nearly died when he saw this building. And he said this building was designed by Otto Wagner out of Vienna. It was the secessionist architect. And here was his impression of the regional architecture of Guadalajara. And you can see that by the tiles, which are yellow, and the, and the smaller uh, intricate tiles are blue, and those are the colors that are used throughout this city anyway. And in Honolulu, again, Beltran Goodhue uh, designed this building, um, again, with the same type of hierarchy of forms and openings and so on. It's, um, it's really a two-story building, but the mass was necessary in his opinion at this point. In, if you go to Spain, you see some of these incredibly charming uh, paseos. And here is, an, here is an example of a small street in, in Italy. And remember, Italy was part of the whole Hispanic architecture movement. It's just that they adopted a different style. Um, there, there's something. You know, architecture c uh, contains um, contraction and compaction. In other words, one of the most successful traditional buildings, this house is done by George Washington Smith. He would take you through a very narrow, uncomfortable corridor. And when you finally got to the living room, it exploded in space and details and so on. Well, it's the same principle where you have a contraction and you have little tables, maybe two or three of them, and then there's a plus at the other end that opens up again and then it closes down again. So it's, um, it's not a bad thing sometimes to have some of these tall buildings. And of course the, the articulation, this is a building in Portugal, uh, it just, the derivatives of what we started with continually change. This is a very, very old town with the use of the mirror doors on top. And it's one of the hillside uh, villages. This is contemporary architecture. But it also works. In other words, um, it is important for architects, designers, not to limit themselves or to cut and paste elements that work, provided that they follow the same principles that we talked about, the, the, the idea of mass, the idea of height, the idea of uh, the relationship of articulation, uh, the building is going to work. And here you have a very, very smooth walls with some rather um, rustic bricks, still Hispanic architecture. And this is the Moorish house, which again is a slightly contemporary expression, but it has all the elements and all of the components that Spanish architecture have. And then there's an architect that really in Santa Barbara that loves to have fun. He's, he, he's, um, he loves Gaudi. But look at the way he treats the walls and the chimneys and the texture, you don't see it very much here, is all undulated and so on. And the Landmarks Commission had a really difficult time trying to approve this building because it was like nothing that was built before. But it also has been weathering well. You can see the streaks of the raw iron and so on. So, and this is the building that I was telling you, this is this restaurant, which is not yet finished, that uh, that little house that I showed you, I was inspired with in the breakup primarily. The tower, the roof, higher element, and so on. Well, uh, just uh, to try to summarize what makes great architecture. 
is if you notice this picture, the intricacy of the loggia at the bottom, the blank walls, the large windows, the curved element at the end against that flat mass and the tower, that is where the magic happens. It's, it's putting all these forms together. And they're all very well managed, even though probably this building is very old. Uh, we had a client that, that really wanted a house, but he wanted a lot of windows because the ocean was in that direction. So when that happens, the best use of putting a lot of windows is to create a loggia, a terrace in front. Now, details, um, and this is more for architects, I think. Uh, it's really tough to draw details in the computer. Um, I usually watercolor my details because it does give you the perfect depiction of what the end result is going to be. And uh, it's the, the details are not so important if you're across the street, but when you're walking next to the street and you see some of these very interesting elements, it makes it a far more different voyage or experience as you walk into the street. So another example of textures, the brick, the color of the screen, and the rustiness of the, of the roof. And if you have a wrapping tile against the wall uh, to scallop or to bring the stucco right up to the wall, that integrates everything very, very nice. <coughs> raw iron, you can do anything with raw iron, anything that you can think of. And the likelihood is that whatever you do, other than the pickets that you see everywhere, it's probably going to be wonderful. And there's our artisans that can still work this kind of detail. This is fairly new. Here's another example. It's, we talked about the dormers. Uh, we talked about some of these um, roof details as an example. In this particular case, the architect decided that he wanted to break the building into three parts. And he did that by creating these piers with the finials on top. This is the Wells Fargo building also. Again, look at the depth of the window, the sloping sills, the way the roof edge is treated. It's a double starter course or triple starter course maybe. And a blank wall with columns that are probably less than an inch, but the shadows really to the work in this case. And here is a detail of that. Look at those tiny little uh, lines that you have. You would say, who's going to notice that? People don't notice that. That's part of the composition. And here's a fairly new building. But the raw iron just is kind of the jewelry on the building itself. These are vents for the, um, for the attic. You know, what a simple way to do it. They put a screen behind it, they recess the vent, and they create an intricate pattern of, of wood. Couldn't be easier, inexpensive. The way the gutters are treated, in this case is copper. And here's another example of the manner in which tiles are placed at the edge. Now what's become very, very popular is this whole idea of these canopies. There's nothing wrong with canopies. It's great. If you do them out of raw iron, not aluminum squares that are held up with, with some cables, that is awful. And that has nothing to do with Spanish architecture. In this case, this is made out of wrought iron. And you can see the sides of it 
with some glass. And again, that was very, very common during the 20s and the 30s in Spain and in Mexico and in a lot of parts. But if you really want to be creative, you can go ahead and do this as well. This is another old building, you know. It works, as long as it works. And here's a very, very simple expression of a door. I don't know where this is. But the, I included this to show you that it leaves, it sh things should be left to the imagination of the designer. And when you see something like this, creativity should be encouraged. The problem is that my fellow architects sometimes are a little too timid and they're saying, boy, if I propose something like that, I'm gonna get slaughtered. Well, no, it works, it, it really does. And it just makes the buildings more and more interesting. <laughs> this is a, another parapet. It's done with roof tiles and clay tiles. Again, the loggias are important. Uh, rather than having projecting balconies in which, well, the Juliet balconies as we call them, the purpose of them was so that the person inside the room can open the doors and swing them open rather than in. And that was the original intent. They were not there to be major decks for people to come in and out of it. If you want that, if you want a living space, set the building back, create a loggia, and set it as high as you want to, or as low as you want to as well. And instead of having a three foot balcony, set the building back 10 feet, or whatever you like. And then you have an outdoor room, which is perfect for uh, Southern California, especially here in San Clemente. Uh, this is, oh, I wanna show you this because this is a very large building. This is the Santa Barbara Courthouse. The courthouse is so large in terms of height, but the designers decided to set it back so far by actually creating a, a performance um, a lawn in this end. And that gives you the ability to be able to contemplate the building. And when you're contemplating the building, then you have to terminate it with some sort of a detail, which was very similar to what you've seen in, before. And if you look at the repetitive windows on the second floor or third floor, uh, are very similar to the repetitive windows of the beach club. Here's another detail that if you have a little niche, um, just use some color and tile and completely transforms everything. <clears throat> In this, I'm showing you this because nowadays, because of Title 24, we have a little bit of a problem with the manufacturers trying to provide true divided lights. They just don't make it when you're calculating the Title 24. And so, by breaking all the windows through divided lights, you basically lose some of the uh, factors that are, that are required for energy preservation. So one idea that we had some time ago was to actually take lead, I don't think it's lead anymore, but lead strips and epoxy them to the window and they look like leaded windows. Now, we had to do that here in El Paseo because this is building was a landmark. The building department says, you can't have leaded windows. All you gotta do is lean on it and the whole window will, will collapse. And so this was the solution. Now, this was done some almost 20 years ago and it's still holding up very well. The idea of providing a, a wainscot, a base, does help. And this is a painting, but it also illustrates uh, or summarizes basically the importance of mass and the openings. And in this case, the water is wonderful. Um, signs, I'm gonna go very quickly. There is, <laughs> there's a whole array of possibilities with signage that I think designers or sign designers and 
are not taken advantage of. You can do so much. This is a found cage. Something as simple as this. I love the idea of three-dimensional signs. This, I don't know what they sell there. Uh, love. Uh, or chocolates. Uh, but it's, it works. And this is a bookstore. And you can see at the end of the tail there's a light. And some cat. Th these things are done out of torched ironwork. A lot of these are very old, and they're in Europe. I don't know what they sell here, probably little elephants. But it's wonderful. OK, just uh, finally, um, San Clemente was perceived as a village. And in a way, the, this, the picture that you're seeing here kind of summarizes everything that we've been talking about. The contrast, the variation, the hierarchy of height, the central district, which used to be the church, was the highest point, And everything began to scale down to the bottom. Uh, these things should be explored because they really do make a contribution. And you can do that with height. And essentially coming down into a residential area where the buildings end up being only Hanson's one-story houses. We talked about how you should set the building back. And then it works. This building is set back 60 feet from the sidewalk. Now, the other thing that, that I really want to share with you, and I think I might have mentioned uh, several times before, we had parking on State Street, and our sidewalks were narrow. And we, I have gone to Paris and was in the Champs Elysees, and I th saw the wide sidewalks, and I thought, gosh, this is wonderful. I wonder if we can do this in Santa Barbara. So I came back, I was all excited, did a sketch, uh, went to see the mayor and the planning director, and I said, hey, you guys, so why don't we put the parking someplace else and we make the sidewalks 20 feet so that you can have outdoor cafes and artwork and so on. And Dave Davis, the planner, says, they'll kill you. <laughs> they will kill you if you propose this. He says, Henry, don't propose it to the city council. Before you do, we have to mitigate the illumination of the cars on State Street. And fortunately, behind all the streets, there were parking lots. And at the time, they used to have the redevelopment agency uh, funds that they said, well, we're going to do it. And so the presentation was made. Uh, I'll tell you, I was a little bit frightened. In fact, I had just put a new Jaguar, and I had it in my driveway. The next morning, all the tires were slashed. And I thought, God, somebody is really taking this personally. <laughs> all we're trying to do is create some sidewalks and cafes and people and art and restaurants and so on. Well, we finally did it, and it's done. And, um, and, and, but we had to create a parking district behind it. And if you, I know some of you are going to go to Santa Barbara. Um, love to give you a tour of what was done. And I'd like to introduce you to Dave Davis, who was the planner that, that conceived this. But it, it really does, it really did work very well. And now, of course, if, you, if you're trying to do a pocket in the sidewalk, the merchants come around and says, you're not going to reduce our sidewalks, are you? So it really, it was an experiment that I think it really did work. It really opened up the possibilities as well. Uh, and one of the reasons I mentioned it to you, because yesterday on the way to dinner, I was walking on Del Mar and I was visualizing, gosh, what if, what if the cars were in the back and you widened the sidewalks? Um, it, w it would be amazing more trees and a, a place to have uh, 
of dining tables and and um, and so on. Anyway, you can see here what happened to the sidewalks. I took this this picture uh, early in the morning, so there's hardly any people here. But it really is a wonderful luxury to be able to uh, walk the wide streets. They actually, the County Arts Commission, have art sculptures and pieces that rotate uh, throughout the entire year. And this is, believe it or not, a mini library. This is the latest uh, sculpture that were placed there. Uh, if you look at the back of it, there's a library in which you can take any book that you want, provided that you bring some other books and put them back again. And, they've, uh, and they have about five of them. But this is the sort of thing that you can do when, you, when your sidewalks are wide. It just completely opens up all kinds of possibilities for the merchants and the city and the visitors and so on. And all the cars would be behind the buildings and, uh, and they won't be blocking the storefronts and so on and so forth. Anyway, the last thing, this is the last slide, but what I want to say is that um, from time to time, I think the Planning Commission, the City Council, uh, the architects, the community need to uh, relook at what we have on Villarreal, Orilla del Mar, and so on. And these drawings were actually generated by a number of volunteers and architects after the 1925 earthquake to see what State Street could look like uh, 10 years, 20 years from then. So it was a vision. And there were many, many drawings that were made this way. But it did, it, nothing like this ever happened, but something similar to this happened. So I think in San Clemente it would be good to set up a charrette, invite the public, have some elevations of Del Mar and, and Villarreal and say, look, this is what we have now. Let's brainstorm some ideas and see what we can come up with. Uh, maybe we'll create a vision. Maybe more landscape and canopy trees, although in Villarreal, having worked with Caltrans before is oh, horrible. But nonetheless, uh, I think doing an exercise of relooking at the city, so I know you have your general plan in place, and if things are moving along very nicely there, but it's just the vision of what we have and what we could have five, ten years from now. I think that's a very healthy thing. And have the community also participate in this. What ideas do you have? Do we widen the sidewalks? Uh, do we put housing uh, downtown? You know, things of that nature. So anyway, that concludes my presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, really wonderful. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Lenny? I think the idea of, uh, we did try to have a visioning study in the early 2000, uh, the whole T-zone and um, Del Mar that fed into the general plan. Mm -hmm. I guess we probably didn't execute the vision part of it very well, but, uh, but we did try to incorporate some of the some of those visions into the general plan we have now but he does make a, a very valid point of maybe it's time to see step with their heads together what do we what do we want to do here <clears throat> going forward to once again we don't have lots of parking behind behind yeah, Elmar but uh, I think it's a very good idea thank you for bringing that but your wonderful presentation as far as all the, ver the various photographs that to show the articulations of the different periods there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think uh, some of you design review subcommittee guys uh, have any comments on that? Um, yeah. We've kind of reorganized design review where we've got two permanent members and then we allow um, every member of the Planning Commission to be able to sit on it. Great. At least a few weeks a year or a free few meetings a year so everybody um, knows what goes on there and um, uh, what it's all about 
but uh, I think the one thing to remember is we've got design guidelines, which mm -hmm. uh, Henry um, laid out, and he made the good point today is their guidelines and creativity by applicants and architects is to be welcomed rather than holding them rigidly to the page that shows window details um, as long as what they're presenting is um, in the spirit of the, the style um, it should be considered and welcomed so I think that was a something I want everybody to kind of remember it's right out of Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, it's more kind of guidelines. It's not a code, it's a guideline. And, That's uh, true. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Henry, for showing us uh, uh, this pr presentation. And you showed us uh, a, a very wide variety of architecture so, so the, throughout the Spain and, uh, and Latin America, and then uh, some cities in the United States. Um, I think what we can see is uh, um, Spanish architect or Spanish even if we narrow down to a Spanish uh, colonial revival still has a, gr a, a greater deal of, of variety uh, in itself. Uh, well, and this city is trying to um, uh, trying to implement a design guideline to achieve which was written by you uh, to um, preserve or sometime uh, uh, promote uh, Spanish colonial revival style of uh, Ole Hansen area. So um, if you can uh, emphasize or, or summarize for us uh, what in your mind is the most defining character of the architecture uh, we need to uh, uh, um, insist or we need to encourage in this city. Uh, for example, um, We've seen some roofing. Uh, some some has a quite big roof, and some has large area roof deck, and some has a, a main sort of style of roof, which we tend to uh, not to like very much. Yes, I can uh, see to that. what extent do you think that uh, um, roof massing should be encouraged uh, in terms of the color? Um, most of the Spanish style uh, for for many people uh, is associated with white stucco, uh, but certainly there are lots of other colors and, uh, and there are stones, so whether they are colored by covered by stucco or they are exposed, and we see a lot of uh, breakers. Um, so, to what extent we we should have um, have them to paint white, or how much do we allow them to um, to deviate from that? Well. Uh, there are very simple and very few principles in Spanish architecture. And, uh, you know, contrast, variation, rhythm, harmony, light, and shadow. Now, what it means is that the mass of the building, if you start with a wall and you want to articulate the wall, you can place the windows having enough distance from the edge of each window, and so on and so forth. If you want to be creative, take a window, pull it up, the other one pull it down, and so on. That becomes more dynamic. Your entrance should be emphasized, either by a simple larger arch with plenty of mass on the sides. As you're going up and the building finishes, there are several options. If you want to have a roof deck, perhaps you should not consider tile roof because it never looks well to have a roof and then a cut and, and then the, the roof. Maybe you should explore the possibility of keeping what is called a sauter, a patio in the roof, but then articulate it in such a way that it does uh, feel like it's another room on top of the building, you see. Um, tile is preferable. Now, there's several kinds of tiles. I believe that S-tile is just unacceptable. There's new companies, and I'm trying to, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna promote any company here. There are companies that are beginning 
to replicate the handmade tiles. They're slightly larger, they're low fired, and so on, very effective. And that's great news because the last thing you want is to spend so much energy and time articulating the facades of the building, and then you look up into the roof and it looks like a red carpet. It, 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 you need the shadows, you need the texture, and so on. But I think th those things that I just mentioned are things that are probably the most important things. Now, if you want to take a window, let's say it's an example, and you decided for whatever reason inside that you want to take the opening and slide it in at an angle, you still have the square opening, but then there's an opportunity for creating an amazing shadow pattern with a window that is actually hidden from view. Well, that's one example of very many. Um, if you, the other way to do it, for instance, in, say in a residence, uh, if you concentrate the mass, the walls of the building on the exterior, behind the exterior and the public area, you can expand your glass very similarly to what they did at the beachcomber. Uh, that's a very good example of that. So, you know, it's just when you're designing anything, I any style of architecture, uh, when you're designing anything, it's very much like, a, again, a symphony, a piece of music, a painting. It is, what do you do with it? And the first thing is, Bert mentioned, you know, Let's take the guidelines, oh, let's pick this window and let's put it, that, that becomes static. It, it, it doesn't really make a contribution. It gives you a proper style of architecture. But I think that if your planners, yourselves in the design committee, uh, can form a design team together, you know. I can't work in a vacuum. Uh, I love having as many people participate in whatever building I'm creating. Uh, the best way of looking at it is, hey, you guys, uh, from the Architectural Board of Review or the Planning Commission and staff, let's just get a big piece of paper and let's brainstorm. And rather than saying, I'm the designer, you're the enforcer, and I'm going to fight you and you're going to fight me. Uh, the, the results are not good that way. Thank you. Thank you for intellectual. Yes, please. Yeah, Henry, I just want to thank you for taking me on a historical journey uh, of architecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. Your personal preference. I, I see two different pictures up here. And one of them has a uh, tower. What's your personal preference on towers? I think towers are extremely important if they're used judiciously. Um, you know, where I, I've always been a proponent of designing a city with a model, three-dimensional model, like they do in San Francisco. And these days, with the 3D uh, printers, you can easily do that. But to answer your question directly, is where do you place the tower? You, you place it in the front of the building, in the middle of the building, or the back of the building, as long as the tower can be seen f either from a distance or you can look up into the tower from a pedestrian point of view, you see. But I think uh, uh, all of the towers that you have in San Clemente are wonderful. In fact, there's a wonderful little tiny tower on Del Mar on an Oli Hansen house that kind of replicates a little bit the tower at, at the beach club. And if you look at the whole composition, it's, it's just wonderful, but you only see it as you're going by. If the building is larger, you should see it uh, both from a panoramic uh, point of view, or you should see it from a pedestrian point of view. And also the way you articulate the tower is critically important. You can get as crazy as uh, Belton Goodhue at Balboa Park, or you can do it very simple. But the same principles of proportion apply. If you're, if you're opening, if you're putting opening, um, do it in a way 
that respects the mass of the walls, like puncturing a wall, essentially, with as many or as few um, penetrations that you can. But I think, I think towers work very well. Not in every single building, but judiciously, yes. Martin, did you? Yeah, um, I want to stress uh, everything he's talked about, and a lot of his pictures um, uh, would have gained a lot of responses from um, people during the general plan uh, studies that if we step away from the architectural style a little bit and think about our village as a whole, if we want, the importance of having experiences everywhere you walk, if possible, um, taking advantages of our alleys that are narrow to, Cliff was working on that for quite some time, who's no longer here, but trying to improve those alleys. And um, there was a huge response and sensitivity to canyonization. I, I mean, people just didn't understand that it's okay for a short period of time and then you go through it and all of a sudden it opens, it opens up to a wonderful space and uh, I'm sure you had to do that in Santa Barbara. Yes, we to did. To educate the people and we, we haven't gotten to that point yet to well, educate the people, so and maybe the best, how would we do that? You know, the best, I think the fear sometimes is, look, if we turn San Clemente into a canyon, that is not, that is not the intent at all. I think sometimes intimate, intimate spaces like Pacels, in between blocks and so on, uh, even a one-story building can give you the canyon effect, isn't it? If you have a one-story here and a one-story here, and you're sitting there at a table having a cup of coffee, you're not going to be able to see the sky. Well, it's the same principle. The taller the building, you mitigate it with landscaping. Uh, a pergola with bougainvillea is an example, and there you are sitting having your coffee or your dinner. Uh, not everywhere, occasionally, but paseos, uh, tall buildings, and so on, uh, have to be carefully thought of where they should be. For instance, in, in um, Camino Real, you have an enormous road, and, uh, and you have one-story buildings. And just imagine if those one-story buildings were two stories, or even three stories, it would begin to bring some intimacy and mitigate the width of the road and the car. And then you go further. Then you put some canopy trees in between the Mexican palm trees that you have there. Pretty soon the trees create a canopy. When the trees create a pan canopy, it just blocks everything that is above. But it does give you the opportunity to provide some housing. Uh, you know, even if it's workforce housing on top of the one-story buildings. But anyway, I know the fear, and uh, you know Newport Beach doesn't have a tunnel effect, even though they're all high-rise buildings. But I'm not sure that looks so good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel any intimacy <coughs> going to Costa Mesa. Uh, I I will say that um, we um, we have to do general plan every 20 years. We're required to do that, and it takes five to seven years actually to create the general plan and I was involved with from the beginning of the first one and I was realizing recent, meetings. <laughs> yeah I, I was realizing even before that with the visioning yeah. process I was realizing you know we're probably about seven years away from starting our next general plan especially since I was on the last one I was a little scary but um, but it you know even after 10 years even though you could say 10 years ago we were doing that sort of thing to figure out our general plan I don't think 10 years is too short of a time yeah. to go back and say all right, we've learned a few things. You know, we've seen some new, you know, we've got the we've got the outlet malls, which is sort of a new look for San Clemente, the way we've done SCR. You know, maybe, you know, it doesn't hurt to go and say, what would we like, what do we need, bring in the local architects, as you were saying, and um, do those kind of charrettes to start to build that, that vision again yeah. and, and feed that into the next general plan. Um, 
I, I do uh, like to, I, I very much liked your presentation and it's always, it's wonderful to hear this kind of thing. It, it, it opens up your perspectives a little bit and kind of helps you take the next step, maybe take a risk or two. Uh, one thing that I've been sort of looking for or waiting for, is, uh, I was on the design review for a few years, um, is something that maybe stepped out a little bit from what we traditionally do. And I think we've done that some, and in particular with the Starbucks you did recently. It was more, mm -hmm. more interesting and ornate than perhaps the we've, mm -hmm. we've done. We've kind of kept things, tried to keep things more simple. There's nothing wrong with that, but you know, it, it doesn't have to always be like that. And um, I was thinking, gee, what would we do if we got something a little more whimsical, for instance, than, we, than we're, we're used to seeing? And so I, I like some of the things you showed us, like the, the modern twist or the, the Art Deco wall that sort of just added a little something, gave it a little, a little spice. Um, uh, and it's something that we should watch out for and, and I think be open to. Mm -hmm. you know, one, of the, one of the reasons probably my, why we haven't seen that is because maybe with our processes, we need to look and say, what are we communicating to architects and, and are, are we making sure that we're communicating to them you know, it's okay to be a little bit playful. We're not going to smack you down or do something like that in design review or in planning. That we're not necessarily we'll agree with everything, but we're we're open to it. We're you know, let's have a discussion about it. But I, I particularly like that. I really love um, yeah, and, and those you know, kind I, of twists. I, I I believe also is just getting a, together a, a bottle of wine and invite the architects <laughs> and designers <laughs> and just I simply have a discussion. <laughs> I was surprised or disappointed that a lot of the architectural guild that resides in the local area didn't come tonight. It was kind of disappointed to the usual them. suspects didn't show up. Uh, Sorry, Mike, society, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. But Michael Luna and, and, and uh, Christine Lampert and some of the other, uh, you know, architects that we, we know and trust with a lot of our oldies and stuff like that. It would have been great to have them here tonight to, to share your uh, your thoughts, and then that would have probably tr said way into a bottle of wine down the street there as we go on to another <laughs> meeting or something like that. But, oh, I, uh, I think that's important to do that because even you know one of the one of the problems with the whole architectural community in general, not just here, is that we lost the sense of movement anymore of philosophy. The Bauhaus, L'Ecole de Beaux Arts, is an example. Uh, even the international style. People used to get together. They used to come up with a philosophy. Um, they used to come up with a direction. They invited artists, uh, people like Pablo Casal, Wassily Kandinsky, um, Gropius, and so on. And you got everybody together, and you influence one another. And you talk about the whole philosophy mm -hmm. of Hispanic architecture and what should be done and how should you be creative? It's a little difficult to be creative with some of the corporate clients like Starbucks and they say, if we, know, if we haven't seen it before, we, we don't wanna go there. Um, although Starbucks was particularly good. I'd uh, like to throw uh, something out that you brought up, I think earlier here about, you know, go look at Del Mar and go, if we could make the sidewalks a little bit wider. And we put a lot of attention in the general plan down on Del Mar, the sandboard line, plots to architectural paseos all the words are there but we we extend a lot of that up and down El Camino Real and in fact we even changed the architecture requirements in some sections from strictly Spanish colonial revival where Santa Barbara's allowed some other wording was put in there to, so we don't look like Santorini and be all the same all the way up and down I agree. Uh, and so I want to pick on your little concept on Del Mar and look at it wider sidewalks and throw something at the community development director uh, out there. And uh, as we uh, as we approve the capital investment program, uh, the engineering guys are going to redo all of El Camino Real, repave it over the next three or four years from Pico to, to Valencia. And you know the bicycle Nazis are going to be looking for their fair share of the of the. Uh, of the lineage out there, and Brenda's maybe going to smack you for that. So. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, Brenda will uh, hunt me down, and Pete Van Nuys, and the usual suspect. But but then again, the uh, the throw out to the community development director is maybe uh, wider sidewalks should be in the fight with engineering uh, as we extend what we did in the T zone area with development agreement up and down El Camino Real before. Uh, 
the payment guys that take charge, it might be an opportunity to start that conversation here very quickly. So I, I would throw that to our our city planner and our city community development director that uh, the engineering guys have got great designs for El Camino Real and you might want to get your ore in the water. Well, we should get our ore in the water, I should say. Thank so, you for coming. Um, I, well, do make, I do want to make sure we got a, a, a couple minutes for a brief break between um, our sessions, but Mark, go ahead. Um, real quick, there's been an uh, marked interest in um, having artists come and do work on or painting uh, murals on buildings, etc. Um, Great throughout the town, and you know there's concerns since you can't um, dictate content of the art, you can dictate where it is and so forth. What's your experience in Santa Barbara on how they handle it and um, um, make it temporary, so make it on canvas, temporary. And that also is fair on other artists as well. You come in and you say, you know, you're going to have your mural on display, whether there's several panels, which we've done in Santa Barbara, whether there's several panels uh, or one large canvas. Uh, certainly you can, and you have four months to display it, and then you, you commission or you select another artist that may want to do sculpture against the wall and so on. It, it, it has to move with art. It, it has to continually change and get new, you see. And that's why the program of sculptures downtown Santa Barbara has worked. Uh, this time the library took the lead and they said, you know, we're going to do five or six question marks with a mini library. And people can come and take a book together or the Music Academy of the West. They went ahead and put pianos here and there. But it's always changing. That is that is where it's really important to do. All right, well, I really hate to break this up, but we do have our regular uh, meeting that we have to uh, attend to. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and speaking to us. We really, really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, really. Take care. So we will um, uh, uh, take a five-minute break before we begin our regular meeting.
absent, Commissioner Wu. Yeah. Vice Chair um, Blackwell. Chair Wu. Here. And Commissioner Crandall. Approve the, the minutes. Second. We have a motion by Brown, um, a second by uh, Crandall. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, I will mention, by the way, our recording secretary of Zonis is not here tonight. She'll be taking the minutes off of the video. So um, we want to make sure that um, we're very clear about uh, motions and seconds and eyes and, and nos and that sort of a thing. And our uh, and our microphones. So please just uh, be, uh, be extra attentive. Thank you. Um, oral and written communications, item six. Members uh, of the public may address the commission on matters of public interest which pertain to the city and are not otherwise on the agenda. If you wish to speak, please step forward to the microphone, state your name and city of residence, and make your presentations. Please limit your presentations to three minutes. Is there anyone who would like to speak on something that is not on the agenda? Mr. Culbertson. Yes. Please. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioners. <clears throat> Larry Culbertson representing the Historical Society. Uh, if I understand right, the uh, the public didn't get to see the uh, study session that just happened, but it was recorded, right? That's, that's correct. That's amazing. Um, that was a, an amazing presentation. I want to thank you and the city for inviting Henry Lenny for giving a, a, w a wonderful presentation on Spanish colonial revival architecture. Uh, there was a lot to digest, but I'm glad that, glad that it got recorded so we can go over it slowly later. Uh, one of the things that really stood out was the, what uh, Henry had to say about the parking. I hope that you encourage the city council to see that, that uh, whole concept of widening the sidewalks on Avenida Del Mar. Because from my point of view, that's one of the limiting factors on Avenida Del Mar. Parking is such a, a bear there that businesses are suffering. So we need to do something. I don't know if it's a parking structure back on Avenida Cabrillo or what, but something's got to be done. Uh, as far as uh, some of the comments that were made, I hope Commissioner Crandall was not advocating for four or five-story buildings on Avenida Del Mar. I don't think he was. <laughs> Good. Appreciate that. Uh, because people really do love Avenida Del Mar. The Historical Society sets up our booth once a month, and the people come and just rave about how wonderful Avenida Del Mar looks. They like that village look, that one- and two-story look, so we don't want to see it go three, four, or five. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention tonight, it goes right along with what uh, Henry Lenny was talking about. The Historical Society is having a home tour on October 12th from uh, t 10 to uh, 4, so I hope all of you will be able to uh, to take the tour. We have eight historic houses and one non-historic that pays homage to the historic houses. But it's going to be a great tour. The Historical Society hasn't done it for about 10 years, so it should be a real good tour. There's going to be food, music. Hope everybody can attend. Thank you. Thanks so much, Larry. Uh, anyone else? Is there anyone else who'd like to address the Planning Commission on something that is not on the agenda? Uh, seeing no one, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Uh, we have nothing on our consent calendar. Um, so item 8 is public hearings. Um, 8A, Zoning Amendment 19-290, Thrift Store Ordinance. Um, Gabriel, do you want to take us through that, please? Thank you, Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, Gabriel Perez, City Planner. This item is Zoning Amendment 19-290 for the regulation of secondhand dealers in the city, uh, also known as thrift stores. The background to this is this item was initiated by the City Council back in October 4th of 2016. Other cities have adopted similar ordinances that would regulate thrift stores. Currently, um, secondhand dealers thr or thrift stores are not listed in the permitted use tables in the city. Um, other background is that the Planning Commission did consider regulations for uh, thrift stores back in October 17 of 2019. Um, and 
they did request the plan commission requested more information on the 100 reference code compliance cases from the staff report presented at that date uh, there's also concern about thrift store definition that was presented and the inclusion of check cashiers pawnbrokers and smoke shops um, with amendments for thrift stores uh, also further clarification from city council on the purpose of the amendment um, let's see when it was this was presented to the city council for further direction in february 19 2019 council directed staff to move forward with the amendments for check cashiers pawn brokers and smoke shops council also directed staff to review thrift store regulations including the definition uh, the distance requirements that were being proposed at the time and the means of approval and methods of other cities to regulate thrift stores um, and since that time we've done that and so we went back to the code compliance information related to thrift stores and uh, here's just a little bit more of a breakdown of um, how that um, does look for thrift stores uh, there were 62 complaints and concerns over a 20-year period regarding secondhand dealers um, 20 of those complaints concern unpermitted signage seven complaints concern donations left outside and 14 complaints concerned merchandise on uh, display outside so this is really the bulk of the concerns uh, 41 in total concerning signage donations and then the merchandise on display we also looked at other cities in Orange County that regulate thrift stores so these are the list of cities um, that we um, surveyed um, Anaheim, Eliseo Viejo, Yorba Linda, San Juan Capistrano and so uh, the requirements for those cities are also provided in the staff report in, in your attachments The zoning amendment proposal does the following. It adds definitions um, for the secondhand dealer. It also establishes operational standards, which includes a security plan, uh, unobscured windows, uh, adequate interior lighting levels, and um, regulates exterior merchandise displays. And lastly, it restricts um, thrift stores to certain zones within those cities, and those would be the mixed use and commercial zones. Um, and at this time staff is recommending that the process be handled at a minor conditional use permit level um, the City Council did provide some direction to look at that option versus a conditional use permit um, at this time you know we felt that the minor conditional use permit it can be conditioned it does require a public hearing from the zoning administrator and um, we can mitigate any potential issues that might be of concern on a case-by-case -case basis through the MCUP um, other changes that staff recommends um, originally we were requiring a 300 foot distance um, from other thrift stores and uh, it was difficult to find any research or data that that supports that distance from other thrift stores um, the plan commission and city council could decide to reduce the concentration of thrift stores in the city uh, if it elects to do so um, but in terms of the evidence that staff was able um, together we didn't see enough to support it uh, the second change is also uh, this includes distance requirements from sensitive uses uh, the code the amendment that was presented previously identified a distance requirement of 100 feet from sensitive uses such as residential zones hospitals playgrounds and parks and um, we didn't find any evidence to support that thrift stores would create problems um, for those sensitive uses the definition of secondhand dealer was also um, in question by the Planning Commission uh, there was concerns that other retailers could be lumped in in the second hand dealer definition and so what you see in red is some of the new language that we added to the second uh, hand dealer definition what this would do is establish um, a metric for what would be considered a secondhand dealer so um, this would mean that at least 50% of the gross receipts are from the sale of a secondhand tangible personal property and the definition shall have no application to the business of selling used or secondhand vehicles 
Now this is similar to a definition in your Belinda, and we thought it made sense. So if um, if um, more than you know, if you have at least 50% of the sales that you're doing in secondhand goods, then it would be considered a secondhand dealer. Um, and then this wouldn't encompass those businesses that are only having a portion of their sales related to secondhand dealers. Uh, one question that did come up by uh, one of the commissioners was, well, what do we do about um, used car sales? So we definitely, um, through this definition, carved out an exception for used car sales. And these are the allowed zones for thrift stores. So the, uh, these would be the commercial zones that they'd be allowed in, a neighborhood commercial um, and community commercial zones, as well as uh, mixed use zones. And identified here is a map of existing secondhand dealer locations. Uh, we've identified about 12 existing thrift stores in the city. Those are identified in blue um, in circles. Uh, a lot of the thrift stores are concentrated on a block um, near the corner of Palizada and El Camino Real. And so there, you can see that concentration in the map. What's also highlighted here on the map are the commercial mixed use zones. Um, where other thrift stores would be allowed to, to locate in the future. Uh, this is a larger map um, of the city that shows all the commercial zones um, in the city, um, all the mixed use zones. <coughs> we did hold a stakeholder meeting on August 21st um, last week, and um, we invited thrift store owners and managers, operators, uh, to answer any questions about the ordinance. And um, some of the feedback we received were as follows, that secondhand dealers um, don't pose an adverse impact to um, the areas that they're located. So they were concerned that there was gonna be new regulations that would apply to thrift stores. Um, one of the things that we did convey is that these amendments would apply to only new thrift stores. It would only apply to um, existing thrift stores if there was a decision to expand or if the business lapsed for more than a year. So, uh, another item brought up was the distance requirements between secondhand dealers and um, you know as I presented before uh, staff no longer recommends that distance requirement from other secondhand dealers. There was also concern about the security plan requirement and also applicability to existing businesses. Um, and I mentioned that this wouldn't apply to those ex existing businesses under circum circumstances of expansion or the lapse in the use for over a year. So staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission adopt resolution 19-033, um, recommending that the City Council adopt an ordinance to regulate secondhand dealers and then recommend City Council find the amendment exempt from CEQA. And that's the end of my presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Don, let's start with you. Yeah, um, you say that an existing business would have to go uh, through these new requirements if they decided to expand. Would you def define expansion? Like they increase their business area 10 square feet or or a whole new building or what's what's it what's the, the definition of expanding yeah expansion would be um, expanding the gross floor area of the building that they're located in so an example would be um, an existing tenant that might be in a multi-tenant building well if they decide to um, expand into another suite then this would apply to that business so 100 square feet, 200 square feet would trigger this. It's a pretty yeah. small requirement to require this whole thing. Any, they they would have to go through feet. the entire CUP program, minor CUP. Correct, and that's how our non-conforming ordinance works in the city. Okay, the non-conforming ordinance triggers on what square footage? Um, on any uh, expansion, so any addition of square footage to the... On any? Uh, yes. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can you run back about five or six slides to the what was a chart of the complaints? Uh, this one. Yes. Um, oh, the co-compliance. 
complaints? Uh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, looking at it, and I'm going to build up to a final question here. Um, there's no complaints about what goes on inside the store on any of these complaints. And um, you've chosen to keep in the security requirements uh, in the proposed ordinance, correct? And I can see that there were complaints for um, things being dropped off and outside the building, in the alleys, whatnot, and I totally understand that. And where I'm coming from on the inside of the building, our building ordinances don't require um, storefront windows on retail stores at all. Um, but we have chose to put in a requirement that the windows have to remain unblocked, um, no obstruction of view inside the building, where every other retail store who has a window, they can have signage, temporary signage on their windows, which block a little of the display. So Mal, are we sectioning out this group and limiting their ability of free speech? No. to not have signage like everybody else can there's there's no issue with uh, with these regulations these are fairly standard regulations for for uses like this you see um, uh, these types of regulations in place for um, all to say various uses in city codes throughout California but aren't those uses that have had complaints or problems no it could be any it can type be of totally use. arbitrary yeah yep Wow okay um, and it's relatively vague on what obstructions they are in the windows, um, since they don't even have to have windows. Uh, I'll ask Adam, how in the world would you enforce that? Or could you enforce? It just says there's no square footage that they have to have a view. Some places will have views, some won't. Um, I, I don't see any criteria that you, you could make a decision on. Um, well, uh, good evening, Commission. Adam Atamian, uh, manager of the Code Compliance Division and Park Rangers. Um, so we do have similar requirements for other businesses in the city. Um, if they have windows, this would kick in. We're not requiring that any business actually have windows, but if there are windows on the building, which I can't think of a thrift shop that doesn't, I, w I was saying something like maybe Sam shoes they've got glass display but that doesn't give you a free view into the store uh, not entirely. Their, their glass doors do yes but not the display cases on each side of the patio entry yes um, um, I see that maybe this is too vague to not actually no it's not uh, you know if, if the windows are required to be um, transparent then any blockage of the windows is going to be identified as a as a violation so if they chose to put I'm just making sure we can um, handle this thing and, and enforce it since they aren't required to have this, uh, windows um, if they chose to paint out the windows completely, now they don't have windows. I mean, if they paint out windows, then they're still windows. If they, they go through a, it's a they glass wall. I've actually it's dealt with this issue in court because um, I've, I've dealt with good. with this regulation, and that's a violation. Any obstruction of a window that obscures a uh, direct line of sight into the business is a violation, and courts have upheld this. This is a this is fairly standard. So painting and eliminating their is, ability to have signage also is okay. Uh, for the reasons that are listed here, this is again this is fairly standard. Okay, so yeah, and they would just, I just want to make sure. And just to just to continue on with what he's saying, what if so if they have a couple of mannequins in the window with clothes that would obscure some of the view into the. If the view into a business is obscured, then there's a problem. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, Gabriel, would you about to say something? No. Uh, um, this, the owners would still be able to apply the sign regulations of the city. So we do have the coverage requirements of like 25%. Uh, but not the way this is written. It says any obstruction in, the or in this new ordinance. Sorry. Oh, yeah, please. The way it's written, I think it says you you can't obstruct the glass the view at all I think that's so vague I don't know how you'd enforce it but apparently we can <laughs> it is more of a general um, application of how windows obscured and so right now we have regulations for signage it can't cover more than 25 percent of the window you can still see inside the building I think the biggest concern is being able to actually cover the window um, you know some businesses do that with the film you can't see entirely inside the building page of attachment three so so this regulations we're looking at uh, at 17.28.275 sub D um, four right so that's the one I'm looking at yeah, yeah. if there if there were if, if if the window is say 10 square feet right and there's in the corner of the window uh, a sign that is uh, two square feet right that 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 sign is not going to obstruct Adams staff's ability to look into the business right that's the intent of this regulation that's how it's enforced throughout California that's how it's been litigated right now if there are signs that are um, uh, obstructing the majority of the view th um, through that window that's a problem but just a two square foot sign in the corner is not going to be a problem I guess I'm, I'm looking at and the mannequins a great example I mean are we trying to view the point of sale or are we trying to observe the racks in the back of the building um, what gets obstructed and uh, you know if the mag if the mannequin's here and it blocks the point of sale and you move it over here and it doesn't I well, don't the way the the way this is written um, is describing a an amount of visibility of business operations that's what that's the visibility we're we're looking at for we want an unobstructed view of the operations of the inside of the of the business I think the Commission's concern is the um, uh, potential discretion required by staff to identify what is adequate visibility this is not uncommon when we're talking about code compliance um, we are required to use discretion to describe a whole host of things from overgrown vegetation to visibility related issues on other properties um, so it's this this as most of uh, um, a lot or I shouldn't say most a lot of code compliance determinations is going to be made in the is going to be made by the actual officer investigating it yeah that's the answer okay Chris did you have a question yeah I have a question for Gabriel if I was a member of the public how would I know um, which businesses fall under these regulations this would apply to new thrift stores that open after the adoption of this ordinance so after a council adopts it and it becomes effective so is there language in there that, that states that we have it once you once you uh, codify it into the ordinance how do you know you know from this date forward this applies to only these businesses Make sense? Yeah. yeah, that's just state law. So uh, every ordinance that's adopted that is similar to this 
um, those same principles apply. So any any business that is in existence before the adoption of the ordinance becomes legal nonconforming. So we could include in every ordinance um, language that makes it clear that businesses in place or if, uh, operating before X date are legal nonconforming, but it's simply a matter of, of, of common state law. Okay. The budget's just not in here? Yes, yeah, not in any ordinance. It's just um, Sen? Oh, yes, I, I have quite a few questions, so bear with me. Uh, first on the security plan, uh, what is the security concern here? In terms of observations of the code compliance cases and having discussions with, with Adam on this, um, the biggest concern is really the dumping of donated items. So security plan um, would be required to address how um, dumping of donated items would be treated or ways to actually prevent that from happening at the location. So um, at a regular retail establishment, there are scheduled deliveries of items. In this case, where you might have a thrift store that allows anyone from the public to be able to donate. Um, you're depending on that person's um, discretion of, uh, or the, that person's knowledge of the hours of operation to be able to deliver that item. And so there's, if they're not aware of the hours and they decide to come at a time when the business is closed, there's the potential that items could be dumped. That's the main concern that staff has, and uh, we believe a security plan would allow us to uh, create a plan for each of the businesses that would prevent dumping from taking place. Less so uh, maybe robbery or burglaries happening at these businesses, um, but more in the case of dumping, dumping of donated items. Uh, if it's a dumping um, issue, uh, creating an unsight unsightly um, situation in front of the store. Uh, if we ask them to have an acceptance box in front of the store, does that solve that concern? That could be something that's addressed through the security plan. Okay. Um, it seems that uh, our industrial area, industrial zone, uh, for example, in West uh, Pico Corridor, would allow through for stores. Uh, but we're silent on this thing. How do you reconcile them? Sorry. That, um, can you repeat the question again? The industrial, the light industrial zones in, mm -hmm. our, in some of our specific plan, for example, the West Pico Corridor specific plan, um, it appears to me that uh, the uh, a thrift store would be allowed to operate there. Can, can you can you confirm that or deny it? You know, I, I wouldn't be able to confirm without looking at the specific plan because sometimes the specific plan identifies um, other permitted uses that aren't allowed in the code or restricts them, and I I don't know if if that would be restricted in the West Pico Corridor specific plan. But if it were, uh, if it were allowed, then is it going to be applied to the specific plan? Are we going to have a specific plan amendment too? If, if the commercial areas of the specific plan identify that the permitted uses for the commercial zone are also allowed in those commercial zones in the specific plan, then this would apply. Light industrial zone, not commercial. Oh, it wouldn't apply in the light industrial zone. But people can have a, a, a lot of commercial uses in light industrial zones for our specific plan. If, it, if it's light industrial and thrift stores aren't specifically called out right now in the specific plan, mm -hmm. this wouldn't change anything for that specific plan. Are they going to be allowing those light industrial zones? They wouldn't unless the specific plan was amended. Wouldn't. Uh, antique store. What's the distinction between antique store and a second-hand dealer? Your definition 
exclude the second-hand vehicle dealer from the definition of second-hand dealer. Um, but antique store was not is not excluded, so it appears to be a subset of a second-hand dealer. Am I, am I right? Yeah. That the used car dealership would be a subset. No, a second -hand an antique dealer? store. Antique store. Yes. No, because it's separated out specifically in the code. Right now, antiques are identified as a permitted use in the mixed use and commercial zones. Um, and it was something that was brought up by some of the thrift store owners in our meeting. Uh, if you look at the definition of a second-hand dealer, right. antique store would have fallen into that definition. Correct. But what we're doing with this code amendment is establishing a definition for antiques, because currently there is no antique store definition in the code. The way the code is drafted currently, antique stores are permitted use. So this, this definition of second-hand dealer would not change that. It would not be a subset of a thrift store. It's a permitted use. This definition just clarifies exactly what an antique store is. OK. Um, the, m most of the complaints are about a signage, exterior display of the merchandise, and then a donation. Um, do you mind if you can quickly flip those pages because I think I have a few other questions. Do the slideshow. Okay. Uh, just just slow, slow down a little bit. Sorry. Oh, um, uh, window, window obstruction. Right. Um, to continue discussion on window obstruction, if a store, a store window, and someone want to set up a store window, there are. Uh, I understand it usually it's encouraged to have that indoor, outdoor connectivity, visual connectivity. Um, but in case someone wants to have a backdrop, by your uh, proposed ordinance, that backdrop would not be allowed. Is that true? And by backdrop, you mean a separation between the window? Uh, if, for example, if uh, behind the window glass, you have a few mannequins dressed. And behind the mannequins, you have a, a backdrop. So you can use a background. I don't know if we would, would you? If clear visibility is not maintained from the outside to the inside, so that code enforcement can see the operations of the business, that would not be allowed. Uh, does it also apply to other businesses in here? Uh, just to these businesses and others that have a similar regulation applicable to them. Okay. And to be clear, from a legal perspective, that's, that's totally fine. From a policy perspective, that's the Planning Commission's uh, choice. But from a legal perspective, there's no problem with that. It's a standard regulation okay. imposed upon certain uses. And uh, typically, uh, it's uh, is a height limit? No, it's just... Uh, it has to stay fairly broad to ensure that code enforcement can make a, a judgment call. So, so the regulation is simply that they have to have an unobstructed view of, of, of operations through the windows. Okay. So there's, there's no percentage that can be imposed because if the percentage, if it's 50%, but they put that right in the middle of the window and the, the margins aren't obscured, Adam and his staff can't see inside the, uh, the window. So this is, this again is standard language applied throughout California. Okay. Again, legally it's okay. From a policy perspective, that's the Planning Commission's it's, prerogative. It's a more than a signage issue. It's more than a signage okay. issue. Okay. Uh, can you continue? Uh, next. 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 I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, let's see. I had a question or two. Um, their uh, compliance rate, um, the, uh, the reported um, complaints, do you see those as any more or less than what we see with other businesses, with 7-Elevens, gas stations, any other kind of commercial businesses? I just know all the cases that we refer to were 
um, there was full compliance achieved um, eventually, but in terms of anything recently, um, maybe Adam can speak to that. But yeah, I'm, I kind of what I'm getting to is is our you know with this rate of compliance, as he said, I think he said ten years, sixty some, so roughly six or seven per year, something like that, for across all of the stores, is that is that unusually high for you know as compared to any other retail or commercial business? I would say that um, there are certain impacts that we definitely see uh, in a, uh, call it a, an, at an elevated rate with secondhand dealers um, that we don't see with um, many other types of businesses. The first I would bring up would be the exterior display of merchandise. Our, my staff walks through downtown most weekends and this is not an uncommon thing that we go in and, and actually talk to somebody about or send a correction notice about and it's um, I would say probably once every weekend we there's there's some business that's out of compliance most other kinds of businesses do we do, do not have this type this that particular issue with them um, the uh, dumping behind properties um, that that is really only going to come um, with this kind of business with any other kind of business it's just dumping it's just somebody's leaving trash behind another business these businesses specifically get dumping of goods for their business um, at a time when they're not open so that that type of thing is only going to affect this particular category of business in terms of the amount of, of I'll call it city resources being devoted to this issue we have a lot of you know we have 3,000 complaints a year about 2,000 cases or so um, this is not the, the vast majority of cases but our cases are are very broad and spread out so when we look at how many of these cases we have, yeah, it's, it, it's a legitimate impact. Um, I'll, I'll say of special note this last year, um, staff probably spent, I want to say 50 or 60 hours just dealing with the Salvation Army down at Shore Cliffs. Um, they, their operations uh, and the, specifically the dumping after hours was was so prevalent that before they even opened people would come and start scavenging through all the stuff that was dumped the night before they required security to actually like on-site security to show up and, and 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 deal with it we made them remove their donation bins because once they were full they, they, they you know people just left 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 stuff behind there so that particular one was was especially time consuming. That one, of course, is probably going to be the most prevalent because it's a the one of the largest thrift stores that we have. But the same problems that exist there tend to exist at other businesses, at a you know to a smaller degree. Um, so just from code compliance perspective. These types of regulations would really would really help us be able to assuage future non-compliance um, with with new businesses that that uh, operate. Thank you. Um, and uh, Gabriel, our um, the one-year time frame for when uh, a place goes out of business, a, a thrift store goes out of business, second-hand store goes out of business, and then their MCUP would remain for one year and then it would lapse. Is that standard for businesses? I seem to remember it being a shorter time frame, but I could be wrong about that. No, it, it's 365 days. So so if it was a, a CUP for, a, I don't know, for a yoga studio, same thing after 365. It doesn't lapse until after 365. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Don? One more time on this. Uh, <coughs> Windows lighting uh, visibility, because most every business out here has a s 
you know, segmented uh, facility. In other words, you, you, the place of doing business, but then there's a wall <coughs> or a, a curtain behind which is shipping, receiving. And is that, uh, maybe you ought to wait on this now, is that precluded by this particular uh, statement in here about UBS got adequate interior lighting during business hour to maintain clear visibility of second dealer operations from the exterior of the tenant space? Because about every business I know, they'll have a wall, a door, and you go in the back room, that's shipping and receiving or inventory, whatever. Uh, is this beyond the common pale that you've been, uh, been yeah, so uh, if I'm espousing correct, tonight? We're talking about kind of backup shop operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this wouldn't apply to that. The The intent here is is to allow code enforcement and police services to from the street look into a business and see if there's anything untoward going on right you see these types of regulations um, with businesses such as massage establishments smoke shops um, businesses that historically um, uh, have more code enforcement and police issues so you yeah, are not dealing with back of house operations this is simply looking in, um, um, into the store the shop the establishment and uh, ensuring that uh, that the customer interactions, those operations, are uh, uh, complying with the the law and with regulations. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Okay, then um, I will open up the public hearing. Do we have cards? Okay. Thank you. So we have one card. Does, does anyone else have a card for this item? Or want to speak? Okay. Um, uh, Zoni Amon. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm reading the wrong one. My fault. Uh, Mary Purdue. Forgive me. <laughs> Good evening. So first I want to say thank you to all of you gentlemen for the terrific work that you do. Not easy to go through all this. I mean, this is my packet that I read for tonight. Okay, I didn't read all of it, but a lot of it. So um, I can't imagine all the things that you do and all the research, Gabriel, you and your team did on this. I had a ton more questions until I sat and listened to everything. I had missed the earlier meeting um, with all the owners. So again, thank you for all that. I do have just a few. I wanted to clarify, I believe that the number of complaints were over a 20-year period, not a 10-year period, which kind of dissipates that a little bit, uh, but doesn't negate it. So it, let's say that a thrift store moves to a new location. Are you covered under the old regulations, or is it all a whole new ballgame? Yeah, it would, it would qualify as a new business. Okay. Yeah, and then the, the new regulations would apply. All right, and then, um, so if you have great ideas on how to get people to stop dumping, we'd love to hear them. Two nights ago, we have on video some SUVs dumping five couches behind our thrift store. This for, for fam, by the way. Five couches. We immediately, of course, when we got there in the morning, called and had them hauled away and paid for that. Um, you know, we know of somebody in the business park, not us, but another organization who had a piano dumped. And it appeared on video, it was a moving uh, group that got paid to move it and they dumped it in their in behind their business so this stuff is gonna go on um, if you have great ideas again we have lights back there we have security cameras we see the faces of the people that did this um, and you know we end up putting the bill for it it was it was nominal but you know again if you've done in your research you have great ideas we'd love to hear them I think as would there are other businesses and is that it I think Let's see. Yeah, that's it. And again, thank you all. Appreciate everything you're doing. And um, we look forward to continuing business here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, seeing no other cards or nobody, uh, nobody uh, 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 prepared to speak, I will close the public hearing and I will open up a planning commission discussion. Pardon? Nobody else is jumping on their light here. Um, I have to say that uh, I definitely think a security plan is good for the exterior and perimeter of the building. Uh, I don't see that we need to get involved in 
security plan of the inside of the building unless there's proof or hi uh, history that um, it's necessary. And I don't have that in my packet and haven't heard that from public comment that it's really needed for inside the building. Um, so I could certainly support the definitions. I don't know if we want to be auditors and try to figure out who's 50% of the gross sales and all, but apparently that's an accepted definition and used in other places. So I will acquiesce to um, the fact it's been done, but uh, uh, with some minor revisions, I could probably uh, support this with uh, a change that the security plan would definitely be for the outside of the building um, to stop the dumping, uh, stop any working on any of the uh, drop, uh, dropped off items um, in the alleys or whatever is adjacent to the property that everything happened inside the building if possible um, and uh, barring any um, comment from other commissioners that sways my mind that's where I am at the moment thank you Zen uh, I would support most of the, the proposed ordinance um, with a few comments um, security plan, I, I, I like to rephrase it as a, um, a, maybe a store plan. Uh, the purpose is to show the receiving trash, storage, and repair yard. Um, so, so to make sure that th those activities are heading from public view. And also, if the store wants to have a temporary outdoor display and they're not right on the sidewalk, they're kind of hitting or could be uh, next to a parking lot, but they're not on the sidewalk. And people want to sorting through things and they want to do some uh, uh, repairing. Uh, no, nobody needs to see it. It's their backup house operation. And I want, I want to see a, a map sh also showing that in front of the store there are place for a donation acceptance box which needs to be tamper proof so people can put their stuff in but it would uh, design in a, in a way, it would be designed in a way that cannot be uh, scavenged by uh, other people. So. Other than that, I think um, we need to look into the possibility to allow thrift store industrial zone, light industrial zones, in our um, specific specific plan area. Because uh, I, I quickly look at that specific plan, it allows a wide range of commercial use. So I think. Uh, being an industrial zone, they can, they can accommodate uh, surface stores. Uh, I like the idea of making it a, a minor CUP instead of a full CUP. Uh, I would support the, uh, main t the requirement to maintain uh, visibility from the, pu from the public right of way into the store to monitor the activities. <coughs> Um, I think the signage is a concern, but uh, this will be solved by, uh, we can tighten the signage requirement on the on the store, but uh, mostly, most likely it's go going to be um, solved by the enforcement of our sign ordinance here. Um, that's all my comments. Thanks. Chris? Uh, I'm su in support of this uh, ordinance. I just have a uh, question or two for Gabriel what type of state licensing exists for um, second-hand shops it's the number one yeah I'm not familiar with the state licensing requirements but it's specifically defined in the business professions code and that's what we cite in our definition for the second-hand dealer um, aside from what the state requires I mean from the city it's it's a business license just a business license? Currently, right now. 
Okay. So, I mean, with this ordinance, the, re the requirement would be the business license and a minor conditional use permit. Okay. So th there's no specific state licensing requirement. Th there, th I have another question. You met with all the owners and, and Mo had a discussion about Most that? of the owners that I could, um, there's probably a couple thrift store owners I was unable to meet with, mm -hmm. but we did send invitations to all the thrift stores for the informational meeting. Can you uh, just briefly let me know what the uh, comments were for the window lighting and the security plan? Um, you know what, similar comments to what was raised by the Planning Commission, like how does that get enforced, what does that look like? They, I think some of the store owners wanted a better idea how to um, apply, you know, this idea of an ob unobscured window. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, since, since a lot of that's going to be determined by the code of compliance officer you know that's something difficult to pin down um, under under this ordinance were they uh, in support of this uh, language I, I think generally those that were there would prefer that there not be any language uh, that's that's proposed uh, for in this ordinance uh, and so that was the only question about the, the unobscured windows is well how do you tell if it's obscured or unobscured and same question for the security plan there was a concern about the security plan um, like what the purpose of it is for um, and the main concern was really for thrift stores that exist if this would apply to them. Mm -hmm. This wouldn't not this would not apply to existing thrift stores unless they were in the scenarios I mentioned they were going to expand or their use lapses after 365 days. Other than that, were there any comments on the security plan? Uh, that was the only comment that received on the security plan. Okay, thank you. On? Yeah. I I'm a general, a fairly well supporter of the ordinance. I think it's come a long way from when everything first started in this big uh, pile of everything that was lumped together. Uh, coming out of council from what three years ago now included, you know, smoke shops, pawn shops, and every other shop imaginable. I think we, we bifurcated everything down to two ordinances this one and the smoke shops now. Um, and so I think it's pretty reasonable um, ordinance. In, Fairly well, uh, fairly well put together and simple. The security plan in the ordinance here says that the submittal, the, the application, a security plan to prevent vandalism, breaking, entering, dumping of donated items and other crimes at the establishment and to perfect, protect the safety of customers, employees, and other persons of the establishment. And this it sh it should be subject to review. The only thing I have about the whole security plan is and other crimes. That's kind of like pretty uniform. <laughs> that covers the entire waterfront. I think that maybe that should be re uh, rethought. You know, or maybe eliminated. Why well, emphasis on dumping? You know, and other crimes. It could be. That, that somebody could require the security plan to, have me to cover all the 300 pro crimes or something like that. Right. Other than that, I think that you know the ordinance is pretty well. I think you, Christopher, we had a good idea to look in the industrial zone there in Los Molinas. It might be permitted down there, and it might be a good area to let allow them to be used. Down yeah, there. I think so. And also uh, on, on the security. But uh, but by and large, uh, I'm supportive of the ordinance as presented. I just like to see the security thing simplify a little bit for these store owners a little bit. Probably is a good thing to have a security plan or an ops plan. <coughs> Allows you to focus your business a little bit. I, I think it does need to uh, be clarified and cleaned up a little bit. How, 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 how do you want them to prevent people breaking into this store? Do we ask to, do we ask a security plan from banks? We don't. Do we ask a security plan from a coin dealer? We don't, we don't, we don't have one, but if there were one, was one, do we ask? We don't. So, you know, we don't ask a security plan for any other store which <coughs> tend to have a lot of cash. So if that's a concern of the security, 
I, I wouldn't have supported adding this burden to, to the store. <coughs> I, I think we should have focused on um, shielding those unsightly activities from public view. You know, maybe they have their uh, 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 service yard so they can do their own uh, sorting, repairing things. Uh, well, one thing to consider with this is that this is going to be an MCUP. And by leaving the security plan a bit open-ended, it is going to give staff, who's going to be probably going to be doing the MCUP, the ability to look at each store and the particulars of the area that it's in and address the security plan in a way that's specific to that store. As opposed to saying every store has to do the same thing. Something like Salvation Army, I would imagine, is probably going to need a more comprehensive security plan than a small, whatever, 20-foot wide storefront that's kind of, uh, you know, off by itself. So, Commissioners, mm -hmm. I was going to mention that when we do have a, a business that requires a discretionary permit, code compliance does add a condition regarding security plans. So even though it may not be specified in, in the municipal code, it is something that we do end up conditioning through the discretionary process. Every business? It depends on the business. So. It's the outcome of having a code enforcement guy that used to be a city planner guy, you know. <laughs> um, uh, just to clarify, it's it's project by project. If code compliance reviews a, a discretionary application and it, um, it appears that they may have security issues, um, depending on their location or their proposed use, we will condition a security plan. Um, those have been applied to residential and commercial properties because we want to ensure that people are thinking ahead about potential uh, issues and there's no type of property in this city that is immune from uh, from vandalism trespassing dumping uh, any number of code violations. So we, we just we want to make sure that there's there's forethought put into every project when possible. Well, I've got you up here, Adam. Um, is there a, anything in our zoning ordinance or code that prevents unwanted dumping? So we heard um, the speaker tonight talked about like someone coming and dumping a bunch of couches behind one of these places. Is that a legal act for them to do that, or is that actually something that they're not simply not allowed to do? That's a violation of multiple laws. Uh, one is um, the state law. Uh, penal code does not allow for um, illegal dumping. In As far as the city's concerned, that could be a violation of multiple sections of our code. The simplest one would simply be littering. Uh, if any placement of any stuff on private property with, that is not permitted by the property owner, is littering so so would it be fair to say that some of the stuff that you might be asking for is like a sign that says you know we don't accept donations after hours it's against the law you know here's the code that says you can't do this that sort of a thing yes it absolutely well, does the city have a plan to enforce those say that one more time. does the city have a plan to enforce those uh, we enforce it already uh, on businesses where we have spent um, time cultivating a relationship to get them to uh, enact security measures. Right, well, my question was... Uh, so my, my what, question. We would, what we would like to do is have signage in place. So when there's signage in place, then people know what the rules are, and it's harder for them to say, I didn't know. So once we have signage, then we move into... To, uh, accessory security items and they could be things like cameras they could be things like gates if we can sh have people shut off a property great there's a lot of properties where that's not really possible and so we would want things like security cameras maybe additional signage maybe security patrol once in a while uh, uh, 
uh, enforcement against people who dump the stuff on there? Uh, when people, that is typically handled by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Okay. Because they, the, the hammer they're using is much, much heavier than ours. They're going to stop people. They're going to stop people because they're going to be citing them for a misdemeanor, um, whereas code compliance is going to be hitting them with an administrative citation, and one stays on your record and the other doesn't. So, so, so just a comment too, to comment um, too, you know, just in case it might be helpful to code enforcement is it sounds like these people will have security cameras and bright lights that come on under motion sensors. That's actually an, can be an aid. To people because once the lights are on it's easier to see what you're doing and to dump what you're going to dump if it is a dark alley and it stays a dark alley it's just more it's more difficult so that might be something to look at i know the natural thing is is for security we want lights yeah that's a that's kind of a natural human reaction but it may not be strategically the best thing to do in, a, in something like this but just something just something for staff to consider well, so well, and we uh, just uh, to piggyback on that that is definitely the kind of thing we consider um, which is why we want a security plan. Most businesses are going to want to be proactive about things, but the way that everybody wants to be proactive may not be the most compliant way to be proactive. Lights are a big issue. Somebody's security lights could be another person's nuisance. So we're going to look at where is this property located, what, what really, what functionally is going to help them, but also not turn into um, you know, uh, you know, not turn into a spotlight into somebody's bedroom, right. which actually could happen with a lot of these businesses because of where they're located. So, for that, for all of these reasons, this is why we'd like to condition <coughs> security plans from the get-go and have them work with staff and, proactively. And I'm actually, I was kind of on the fence about this, but I, I'm more convinced now that it, having this kind of flexibility, because we've got, say, a big operator, um, we've got some of these it sounds like they're right next to residential zones or probably right across the alley i imagine from some of these residential zones some aren't so i think staff need some flexibility to say well you know we need to talk about fencing here but fencing over here doesn't make sense for whatever the reason for that um i'm also not a big fan of allowing these in industrial zones this is a commercial use this is why we have zoning you know we put industrial over here we put commercial over there so that those uses can be compatible um, it can be a problem for both businesses if we you know take something where people are kind of going shopping and browsing and trying things on and and that's in an industrial zone um, it, it, it's kind of like we would if we do that we might as well say kind of any retail can go into an industrial zone and we don't I don't think we really want to say that so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't support that but I I, I do think staff um, has done a good job. I think this has been a journey we've gone through with all of these. I think it's great the the, um, the <coughs> reaching out as you have. I think it's pretty obvious from the first time we talked about this and the response that that was here, and now even the people who spoke have, are gone because they seem very comfortable with um, what staff has proposed and how they're how they're going to be handled by staff in the city. So you know I think that's a that's a very good sign and a good win that um, there's been a good collaboration between. You, know, you guys on staff and uh, and the people who are going to be most affected by this and including the rest of the city um, I think things like the window visibility and things I, I could kind of go either way with that I, I kind of don't have a problem with it if, if everybody was going to take it out I would still vote for the ordinance but um, uh, but I think it's fine you know being in there and so I'm obviously I'm, I'm kind of in support of uh, uh, of the ordinance. So, Don, did you have something? Just one uh, minor comment, Jim. Uh, uh, as I thought about it, there is some clothing sales going on down in Las Molinas. You go down there and buy wetsuits and all that stuff uh, uh, right there next to Drew Brophy's uh, studio stuff, right? Uh, so, there is some merchandising going on in Las Molinas as I think is, about it more. Is that full retail or That's accessory light. use? It's, uh, I know it's light industrial down there, but I certainly know that it's. Uh, you know, you're, you're buying used surfboards and used uh, mm. wetsuits and everything oh, else down there. there uh, anyway, I'm supportive of the ordinance. And uh, it's always, some people groan about a security plan or a plan. It's always good to have some requirement to make you sit down and really think about how you're going to operate and do things anyway. So, yeah. Just on a third idea, um, uh, for those thrift store uh, with the alley behind, 
Is, is it a good idea? Maybe we can ask them to put a fence all the way to the property line. So, and then they have locked it, lock it after business hours. So then when other people want to dump stuff, they cannot dump it inside the yard. They can only dump it in the public right away. Then they will be, they will be um, prosecuted. <laughs> Um, because if you don't have that fence, then the people would have dump the stuff in the private property part of the, the backside, and they store that we don't mind having them dump it on our property. Then, C Commissioner Wu, I was going to provide some clarification. I know you asked about the West Corridor um, specific plan, Pico Corridor specific plan. So it it. Thrift stores would be allowed in certain zones in that specific plan because there's neighborhood commercial and community commercial. And um, where um, there are uses that are permitted in the code for those zones, they're permitted in for neighborhood commercial and community commercial in that specific plan. So just wanted to provide that clarification, but it wouldn't allow it in light industrial. Um, in order to allow it in light industrial, um, there would need to be a specific plan amendment that's approved um, and that's not what's for consideration of Planning Commission but we are doing the updates to the specific plans um, this this next year on the West Corridor Pico Corridor specific plan so there will be the opportunity for the Planning Commission okay. to discuss uh, well, what, what are allowed in light industrial zones? It says the light manufacturing business park professional offices uh, supporting retail, restaurants, and financial. Supporting retail? Supporting the industri industrial use? Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm just going to throw this out to move it along. Um, that minimum standards, item four, windows and lighting, the more I think about it in our discussion, if it's an eight foot high window, they can put signs all the way across the top. Um, anything above um, five, six is visible. So any signage could be held to the top. And I think maybe that can be enforced. So um, I think with the discussion, I can be convinced that we leave that in and I can live with that. And um, on the security one, the security plan, um, I see just, you know, we don't want to get too specific because they are going to um, be pretty much custom for each and every property. Trying to just fence in the yard. They're going to have parking spaces on their property and all that are, you can't fence in. So just fencing isn't necessarily an option for some, but it certainly is for Salvation Army because, I mean, th they can fence in that whole yard. Um, so that's fine. So if nobody has any other changes, I'll make a motion. Um, Go for it. I uh, move we adopt. Uh, I don't see an ordinance number here. From attachment two. Look at the <coughs> exhibit A. Oh, there is. There one is. For us. You're looking at the uh, draft yeah. for the okay. uh, city council. Um, uh, resolution number PC 19033, a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of San Clemente recommending City Council approve an ordinance to enact zoning amendment 19290. And I will not read the balance of it. Um, and I move that we approve it. Second. Motion by uh, Crandall, second by Wu. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. We are on to uh, new business. Anyone have any new business? Old business? We are on to reports of commissioners and staff. Does anyone have anything to report? Oh, I have I'll just a couple of mentions. Um, our September 11th DRSC meeting, um, I think that there's maybe some uh, attendance issue. I think the the main person is going to be off on a work uh, thing. The second person is going to be off on a work thing. I'm going to be off on a work thing. Okay. So you might just want to make sure that we get the full, actually. Um, I, I will thing. be able to make the 11th or whatever it is. Okay. I'm not going until the 14th. 
Okay. Who's who's going to be here then for that meeting? Then? Okay. So it'll be two. Okay. So those two and, and then, then after that I'll be. You have to find like the third or fourth alternate for <laughs> yeah. for that day. So. Okay. Um, it looks like on um, October 2nd, we're going to be doing the Peer Bowl specific plan update. Will we have a chance to get some early draft of that, some preview or markup version? I know we did that for yeah. um, something else, and it was very helpful. Yeah, Chris Wright, he's, he's um, the project manager on that project. I'll talk to him to see if we can get something well in advance. And I think that would be a good idea. Like um, if we can't do that in advance, then I recommend we um, reschedule that item to a later date so there's enough time for the plan commission to review it okay yeah be great. i'm gonna be gone on the second of october and i will also <laughs> so should we just post is yeah, there that sounds good we're going to we're going to be missing at least two people anyway so if, it, if we might postpone it because of when it might be produced it might be good just to do it now and okay so okay um people should note that the um planning commission meeting on the 18th and two weeks from today is canceled so another meeting then uh, for those of you who didn't know, um, last night the City Council um, uh, decided not to call up the Artifacts um, Brewery. So the requests that we made of them, in, in essence, they, they declined the requests we made of them regarding of that. So and a tie is a no. Tie is a no. So um, I personally, I think that there's things maybe to discuss that we need to discuss with that. I think it actually has an impact on the, the perspective and running of the planning commission. But I just uh, I just saw it during lunch, so I haven't had any time to really get into thinking uh, thinking deeply about it. So I'm not going to speak to it tonight, but perhaps next time. Yeah, the long-term potential downtown is a lot of other people to come in with the same type of concept, and it's going to have a huge impact. Yeah. So just something uh, for so you there's might, a, what's the horses lead the corral. Uh, on that artifacts concept, there's a San Juan winery been down the street for two years trying to figure out how to open, you know, and so now they're watching them come in. And uh, so there's a, a long range perturbation of that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that was brought to your attention. If you want to watch the video, it's uh, it's up there. It's pretty yeah. far in. They, they delayed the consent calendar to pretty late in the, yeah. uh, in the meeting. It was interesting so. to watch. Yeah. Um, that's what I had. Does anyone else have any other thing for reports? No, no, I'll read it in German if you want me well, to. Well, I have, I have one update. So the, you might recall last planning commission meeting, we considered the, the small cell facilities. So two of those facilities were appealed to the city council. So that'll <coughs> go through the process. And only two of them? Only two of them. Which, which two? Um, I know the they one. Yeah, let me pull those up right now. Twenty-three. Well, that was sweet. That's actually what we it's, anticipated. It's uh, three zero one eight Camino uh, Veracruz, and then eleven zero one Calle del Cerro. But the other two weren't appealed. One, in addition to the discussion about the interpretation, we are going to schedule a discussion on interpretation in October. So um, City Council wanted um, the Planning Commission to discuss interpretations and maybe establishing more procedures um, for interpretations in the future. So that will Which be an item. Which interpretation? Um, no, just any interpretations. The, the actual section of the code. Just the general. Oh, or right. Just, yeah. Well, well, let me ask too, because I know we've got some zoning ordinance stuff, you know, in the pipeline. Um, are there currently any plans to take the interpretations we currently have, which I think are, I think I heard there was six or half a dozen or a dozen, and incorporate those into the zoning ordinance? Let me inform you. I think a good idea in the future might be for us to do an update of our long range plan for, for, the, for the city. Um, so there's a lot of ordinances that are in the queue. Um, one of them is a, a cleanup of the of the code. So there's a lot of um, there's certain ambiguities that we find in the code that need to be addressed. Um, we're planning to take that as a batch amendment to the planning commission. So it actually will be a very monumental task to be able to do that. But involved in that will also be a cleanup of the interpretations that have been made in the past by planning commission or the city council. Well, actually, the planning commission that require code amendments in the future or recommended code amendments. 
Um, so one of them, like we mentioned before, um, 2013 interpretation that breweries could be allowed in um, certain commercial mixed-use zones. Uh, that never made it into the code. So what we would do with these batch amendments is include it. But there's so many code amendments that have to be made that uh, we're trying to, instead of taking care of them as separate um, code amendments, actually batch them together and be considered at the, at the Planning Commission City Council. If we don't do that, it'll take years to go through that process. Okay. Since we're talking about a codification, I have a question. Maybe Don, you know it, or maybe Mel know it. Uh, the the measure measure V about open space that was never codified. What's the reason behind it? Uh, I don't know why it wasn't codified. I mean, I know the ordinance w was there's an ordinance that's adopted, right? Right. Um, but the reason the ordinance there was a, a vote that created it. measure V, the open space. Right. That should be incorporated. I don't know why. That's probably one of those batch I think we all were under the opinion it happened, but uh, maybe. Yeah. That's another thing. That's another. Uh, that's probably that's something should be in a batch submission again. How about a dark skies ordinance? <laughs> we got halfway through it and stopped, so <laughs> it'd be nice to pick that up again. So, all right. Is there a is there more discussion or a motion for adjournment? I'll vote. I'll Do we have a date to adjourn to? Yeah. It's going to be a good point. Oh. It's going to be the first one in no in October. Yeah. I move that the next we turn to the next regular meeting of the study session and planning commission will be October second, twenty nineteen, at six p.m. Council chamber look at one hundred and fifty city of Kansas, California, as a September eighteenth, twenty nineteen meeting to cancel the lab business. Uh, motion by Brown, second by Crandall for um, adjournment to October 2nd. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously.